You got it. Okay. That means we're officially started. Uh, so it is a, a mix of some of the new information today. We have some guest presenters as well as recaps of sessions from last week. So if you attended last week, that will be a synthesis of what was in those sessions. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome the Institute Director and Co-Founder, Esha Malcolm. I don't want to break any rules. So <laughs> it's truly a pleasure to have everybody here today. Um, I, I actually I was looking around the room. I don't know who's online, but I was looking around the room and everybody here I consider a friend. So it's, it's really cool to have everybody. So let me just start by some good news. So this is the last time you have to hear my random thoughts about anything in life. Uh, so, uh, and I will use it wisely. Uh, so I am stepping down very soon. I'm joining the University of Sydney, Australia as an associate dean of academic affairs. So I'm getting as far as possible from here to maximize your probability of success. Uh, so, Maybe I, I was supposed, Julia told me to share a little bit of historic perspective and overview of the program. So let's start with the historic perspective. So I was looking at this whole experiment, what we call ICDD today, and I found out that similar to everything I had in my life, whatever success we have right now started with a disastrous failure <clears throat> on, my, on my part. So the story goes like this. So for a very long time, Ohio State, realized that we have a lot of strength in this area, cybersecurity and trust. And there was a lot of thinking about how we can bring those strengths together and, uh, and move forward in a unified way. So when I started my service as a chair of the electrical and computer engineering department, uh, I got a phone call from the dean at the time and asked me for a meeting and says, so we figured out how we're gonna do this. We're gonna start a search for someone to come and lead this area. And we want you to chair the committee for the search. So I felt that's a very exciting thing. I agreed to it. And then we started forming that, that committee. So we had a, a, an amazing committee. And I, that's where I met Dwayne. And I met my partner in crime, Helen. And as we were working in this committee, uh, since we were forming it, the decision was, let's not search for the director. Let's as well try to come up with a foundation for our thinking. So when the new director comes, there is a good starting point. So soon enough, I became the person when they call, when they have any cybersecurity issues on campus. And I improvise, so I go to those meetings. And that's why how I met Mark in his previous life. So I went to a meeting in Mark's office and Mark was saying, you guys have a lot of great stuff going on, but we don't know about them and you need to talk to us more and that kind of stuff. And I started moving in that direction. So the committee was forming, we were forming our thinking and by summer, summer 29, um, we were actually in a, in, a, in a meeting with Columbus State. And after the meeting, I got this phone call from higher ups in the university saying, well, we have a change of direction right now. There's something going on that's way above your pay grade. This search is over and uh, we're gonna figure out something else. I said, so what's going on? I said, yeah, yeah, we're going to figure out something else. So for reasons that I was not aware of, the search was over at that point, and we, they, the university was going to do something else. So I really felt horrible because at the time I was thinking there is a lot of potential, and we were doing some good stuff, and I felt that we should move forward. So I called Helen. I said, uh, I want to come and meet you. And I went to Helen and said, so what do you think about this? And she said, well, what can we do? And there is good stuff. I said, why don't we do this thing? She said, well, so what do you need from me? I, said, I have no idea what I need from you, but maybe maybe we should do something. And Helen is very kind and very nice. So she said, okay, I mean, do something. So I got Helen and we went to our VP of research at the time, Morley Stone, and I told him, well, we have been doing this stuff for a very long time and, uh, and maybe we should do it. He thought about it and said, so what do you need? I said, a little bit of budget and your support. He said, okay, go do it. We're gonna call it a startup. So if it fails, it's your problem. If it <laughs> succeeds, we all get the credit for it. So we started January, 2020. We had our kickoff. 
and most people here were around. And as we're moving, I also got to learn more what Walid was doing in our department and hardware security. I got to learn what ZQ is doing. Actually, ZQ is a speaker in this first uh, and this was the first kickoff. February, we had our internal deliberation. We got everybody. We started to think about what are we going to do and how to focus and the thrust and all this. And we came up with some very good ideas. And this was the last in-person meeting I had. This is the last before this one. So we were very excited. We were going forward and doing stuff. And then in March, everything shut down. We went virtual. During this virtual time, uh, we felt, I mean, we're all stuck at home, nothing better to do with our lives. Maybe we should move forward. So Elam and Anish and Kadir and Vemel uh, won a big couple of big grants from NSF from the state of Ohio. And we started doing this OCIMM. Ohio Cybersecurity Initiative in Mobility and Manufacture. So group came together. Then I reached out to ALM and says, since we have, I have nothing to do with my life, maybe we should start doing something about degrees and education. I got to know Aaron about, and we got Battelle engaged with us to offload our work to smarter people. And, and then we have a couple of certificates that are approved now in a master program. So, when I was looking at the success, whatever success it is, oh, I forgot the most important person. As a chair, I got to know Julia. She was doing this amazing stuff with OHIO and I felt OHIO is amazing and good, but Julia can do much bigger and better things. So I kind of grabbed her and said, Julia, I mean, you don't have too much work at your plate. And she said, are you crazy? I said, no, no, you don't. Let's do more stuff. And again, as with the rest of the kind people here, she agreed. Uh, so when I look back, what's the success? It's this group of people that I got to know. So today, as I'm stepping down, the only thing I can point to is we actually have a community. We have people who are working together, who like to work together, who are doing amazing stuff. And over the last week, when we had those sessions and workshops, they all got ownerships of some pillars of this institute that they want to move forward. And it's exciting because they were doing great stuff on their own. Now they will do stuff together and the force multiplier will be great. So the rest of the day will be us hearing from those people about their vision for moving forward, what progress have been made and how they want to achieve their vision. Um, the other thing we were intentional about from the beginning is to keep everybody engaged, internal and external. So we have Don here who was a supporter from day one and he was a speaker in the kickoff as well. So we want to keep all our stakeholders, whether partner institutes in Ohio, whether industry, whether the community, whether our students or our faculty, because success starts when the vision and the strategy comes from within. So with that, this is my last random thoughts. If you wanna hear any of these random thoughts again, you have to cross a big ocean. Uh, so with that, Julia, the rest of the program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hashem. Um, I have a, a couple minutes before we bring Don on to speak again. And I, I just wanted to reinforce your statements about community and how we're coming together with different perspectives and different interest areas, different areas of expertise. And I, I believe I, I heard this repeatedly from, from Helen, our, our um, co-founder here, who's gonna speak with me later this morning. But we, we have these three domain areas within uh, obviously research. Research is certainly the, the big rock in, in the bowl, but we also have education and the curricular programming. And the third domain is engagement, whether that's industry engagement, cross-campus engagement. And so we call it today outreach. Um, and events, but so always think of think of the presentations today with that mindset, with this the thought of we have these research, education, engagement, and and hopefully today we'll see where all of these cross sections are hitting, kind of the center of that Venn diagram. Um, I don't know if I have anything else to say housekeeping wise. I think we're doing well. Uh, if you are here in person, remember we do have parking validation, so Cal can get you set up with that. Mm. <laughs> um, 
people online, I'm supposed to remind you that you are also able to change your views uh, in your webinar. So you can see we have various splash screens and slides later. So you have control over that. And I think that's all my notes for this morning. So Don, if you are ready, I'd love to hear a moment from you. This is Don Bowen from the CIO from Huntington Bank. Industry oh, thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, offering me the opportunity to speak. Uh, welcome to everybody, and thank you to all the industry partners that are out there. Uh, I apologize that I didn't have a chance to coordinate my remarks with all the rest of the industry folks, so you guys can throw something if oh, what I say is a little off from uh, what you guys are thinking. I also didn't have a chance to coordinate it. Uh, with the rest of the folks, but your three pillars actually hits pretty solidly uh, with the points I was gonna make here. Um, I'll ramble on a little bit, but I wanted to take just a minute to really set the context uh, for it. Uh, what I'm gonna say probably is blatantly obvious to everybody in this room and everybody virtually, uh, but at no point in the history of our nation have we been more dependent upon our IT and internet infrastructure than we are today especially given the last 18, 20 months, right? Uh, you know, it has huge economic impact to us. Um, it's used extensively, you know, during the pandemic for education um, and for informing the public. Uh, and that's becoming even more important. So really happy to see the disinformation discussion uh, later on today, because that's a definitely a meaty topic that we all need to talk about. Um, you know, it really is uh, a large percentage of our national wealth is in the intellectual property of not only our educational institutions and our research institutions, but also our companies, right? The intellectual property that we have, um, and that many times uh, wanders off when it shouldn't, right? So we need to figure out a good way to defend against that. Um, and obviously, given my background, uh, the defense of our nation uh, really relies upon that infrastructure. Uh, and when I say that, um, if, if you haven't served any time in either a Department of Defense or an intelligence agency side of things, you would be amazed uh, by how critical uh, US private industry is to the Department of Defense, uh, especially if you're trying to move anything. I'll take the simple uh, aspect of logistics and how you move something from point A to point B. Uh, the US military can't move all of that. We rely very heavily on private industry to do that. Um, so bottom line, we must secure our future as a nation and quite frankly, as a globe. Um, we need bright minds to defend our current networks and our nation. Um, I know one of the first things everybody says from an industry's perspective is we're clearly looking for that talent, right? Absolutely. We are looking for talent from the bright minds that would be educated out of an institute like ICDT. Uh, and the Ohio State University. Um, but it's not just a, a, an industry need for entry-level SOC analysts or penetration testers, because I know there's a lot of folks out there that think cybersecurity is just pen testers and SOC analysts. There's nothing more, right? And, and there's a huge wide variety uh, of job families amongst that. We really need diversity, and I'll underscore this several times. We really need diversity and diversity in thought, right? Our adversaries are coming at us in an incredibly diverse manner. Uh, we need to meet that challenge equally with that diversity in thought on how we defend. Um, we also need that diversity in approaches to architecture, implementation, and how we defend our businesses and services. Um, a wide variety of cybersecurity professionals uh, is needed from incident response to identity and access management, to network security engineering and architects, to data protection, forensic and investigation analysts, to security awareness trainers and instructors. Um, it is a wide variety of job families in cybersecurity. Closing the current uh, cybersecurity uh, talent gap is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Uh, I believe a hallmark of ICT, ICDT success will be how it influences other departments to address cybersecurity in their curriculum, 
right? So not only do we need the talent, but we need to influence other areas of the university, right? To incorporate cybersecurity concepts into their curriculum. Any worthy MBA program should address cybersecurity risks and how to approach their management. Uh, I speak from recent experience. Uh, cybersecurity risk during mergers and acquisitions um, is a very important topic. Uh, and it's just as important as all the other accounting, finance, marketing, and strategy aspects of an MBA. Um, any engineering and IT related degree should incorporate security in design and development principles. Uh, we try something at Huntington, and I know a lot of other firms do the same thing, secure from the start. Don't build your product and then figure out how to secure it. Start up front with those security requirements and principles, build it in. Any healthcare-related degree should discuss the importance of protecting sensitive personal health information and many other security topics around patient health security. Any international studies or foreign relations degree should address how nations depend upon information, inf information infrastructure, how they defend them, and how they use them to influence other nations. That area right there, I think, will be more critical in the following years than it ever has been in the past. Lastly, but not least significant, any software or system development curriculum should demand teach and value security concepts in code and system development. We must move towards trusted systems and trusted code. Cybersecurity faces many challenges. It will be the bright minds that ICDT produces that will help to solve these issues through capstone problems, industry challenges, and research efforts. The need has never been greater. We as an industry look forward to the continued partnership with OSU ID, ICDT to meet these tests. Diverse cybersecurity workforce talent, influence other departments curricula to include appropriate cybersecurity knowledge and progress on cybersecurity challenges through research and applied learning. Those are the three principles, I think, from the industry side that we really need to see from ICDT. Thank you for listening. If you guys have any questions, please reach out to me. That story about mergers and acquisitions, what is the risk? Uh, generally, if you're acquiring a firm, you want to understand their risk uh, their risk profile from a cybersecurity perspective. Uh, for instance, uh, Yahoo. If you're, uh, well, Yahoo would be a good one. But if you're acquiring another bank, my bank is currently in the middle of uh, acquiring another bank, right? We want to understand what their current IT infrastructure is. Even if we're going to throw it away, there's a period of time under which we operate with both infrastructures. And at some point, you actually tie the two together. So their risk is your risk. So you stand during that time period, you know, you, you did that merger thinking you were going to increase your business and increase your profits. Uh, you may have the opposite if you're taking on risks that are unaware. And I will tell you, I've seen several businesses, and Helen gave some examples there, where people didn't think through the risks around cybersecurity during that merger acquisition and ended up regretting it. Boards of trust, boards of companies, too, are uh, being encouraged to have people on the boards with cybersecurity experience, but as they do m and activity, there, there is a responsibility of the board to understand the cyber risks that are coming in and, and oversee and govern that as well. Cyber risks specifically, not just generically enterprise risk, but cyber as a as an issue. current. Popping up. Yeah. Okay. So when you can't toss her and you're doing the business going down. Okay. Do you want me to go ahead and talk about? Okay. So um, I'm uh, Mark Bartman. For those that uh, maybe don't know me from online, Don and I kind of uh, uh, co-moderated the industry panel last week. These were uh, there was a lot of notes actually that came out of it. Um, I just pulled a, the sort of what I thought were some of the highlights, and Don actually hit on a couple of them this morning. But my perspective is, and I'm not, you know, a faculty member here at Ohio State. Um, I spent my entire career in the 
United States Air Force uh, flying fighters for the majority of that career. So my, my perspective on cybersecurity comes at it from quite of a different perspective than even Don or, or Helen or any of the faculty members that are here at OSU. My perspective on this is that Ohio State, as obviously Ohio's land grant university, should be the leader when it comes to a lot of things that deal with cybersecurity and how it integrates overall with industry, with academia, with government, any of these kind of areas. And so when you kind of look at some of these next steps up here, I think you'll see maybe the flavor of that, right? Which is codifying the, the industry advisory board. Um, you know, that's something we that we started talking about back in January and February, as Hesham met, uh, mentioned at the very beginning of this. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, some of these things sort of waned a little bit. So now here we are back. We need to sort of revitalize these things and bring them up to the new leadership of the university and try to push these things forward as that they are important and they need these are things that, that really need to be done. And again, my perspective anyways, is that Ohio State is in the perfect position to sort of be the leader when it comes to these kinds of areas. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The uh, collaboration from the industry to address research topics. Again, that was another thing that we sort of talked about uh, 18, almost 18 months ago now. Um, but that's going to be key, I think. Now, the, the real question that is probably, if it's not in your mind, it will be shortly, is this idea of, okay, industries cycle when it comes to things that are going on right there. And, and uh, Aaron from Battelle could probably weigh on on this too, right? Is it's a fairly quick cycle. It, it typically churns, I, I don't know, Helen, maybe every, or non three to six months or something, there's probably new things going on, potentially that you're having to address an industry out there for it. Research obviously tends to take a much longer period of time on that. So the question I think is going to be, how does ICDT potentially work with industry and faculty to address this issue of cycle time when it comes to doing research and being able to help industry solve some of the problems that they have for that? So I think that's a, that's a, a great next step for this next year uh, to think about as well. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that it, this is kind of interesting, because actually uh, uh, I, I sit in on a lot of the Ohio cyber um, collaboration community meetings that they have, which has a lot of industry partners across the state of Ohio, as well as uh, a lot of the nice uh, different types of nice community uh, NICE, not that they're nice, but it's the part of NIST, right, uh, that um, that uh, talk a lot about the fact that a lot of the ind individuals, the students that come out of academia that go into industry, that they may have really great technical skills, but when it comes to, and there's different ways you can frame this, some people like to say soft skills, some people like to say maybe non-technical skills, but that's maybe where there's an issue that could universities probably ought to work on a little bit. So like Ohio State, I know is going through, or I don't know if it's done yet, but they're completely redoing the whole gen ed process for uh, new students when they come to the university. This might be, you know, one of those things that could somehow be sort of laid in to the way that the new gen ed program is going is to help work for some of these students uh, when it comes to presentation, communication skills, those kinds of things. Um, that fourth bullet up there was uh, something that came up by well, actually one of the faculty at Ohio State. I don't see him here today, Steve Bibbick. But um, I thought it was really a great idea. Um, you know, Ohio, or excuse me, Ohio State has something on the order of like 200 centers and institutes across the entire university, right? From what I have gleaned anyways over the last two years of the work that I've done with ICDT here at Ohio State and some of the other um, uh, areas is that there's very little collaboration that takes place across many of those centers or institutes. So, I, and Steve's point was, is, is that there ought to be more collaboration that takes place because in a lot of cases, especially I would, and I'll make this assumption and I let me know if I'm wrong here, but many of the centers are, and or institutes, right, that deal on much more sort of technical challenges as opposed to maybe sociological or other types, they may actually be working on problems that are very similar, that potentially have overlap or they may be looking for somebody that has particular skills in a particular research area and not even know that their next door neighbor in the building over here on campus is doing research in that area because there's very little collaboration that goes on between all these centers and institutes. 
So that was an idea that came out of last week. That again, with my background in the military is that you typically don't survive if you're not collaborating, if you're not working as a team to solve some type of a problem uh, out there. So this, this is, I think was something that came up that I thought would be great to potentially has a, a sort of a pillar moving forward. And then this last one here was a suggestion that came up about trying to partner with the Fisher College of Business here is that, is there a way maybe to put together some kind of a program that can be given to corporate boards to better educate them on you know, the needs and the importance of cybersecurity in the decision-making process that goes on? Um, and I don't, Helen or Don, or if you want to speak to it now or later, I mean, uh, feel free, but I think this is something that industry can really bring a, a great perspective to when it comes to, you know, what, what do we need to do to, to potentially um, work this kind of an issue, Helen? Yeah, so pre-COVID, we did talk to Fisher about engaging with the Risk Institute to, to sort of talk about cybersecurity risk technology risk, information, disinformation risk as part of the Institute's programming. I think we can re, we can dust that off and see where they are now. Um, so I, I think that, I think the, um, the collaboration paths are there. We just now need to apply some, some sort of tactical intent behind it. So it's a, it's a great suggestion. Um, so before we move on, any other comments or questions, Cal, is there anything online, any Q&A or anything on anything that Don talked about or, or this I don't slide? see anything yet, but um, okay. everyone is welcome to use the Q&A and I will shout out your questions as it comes in. Uh, we do have a question. Uh, I'm Anne Marie Meyer from American oh, yes. Electric Power. Nice, nice to meet you in person. You as well. Thank you. I thought I recognized you. Y'all look so flat or something. Yeah, like exactly. Uh, so the industry advisory board. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, and so I'm gonna, interested. In I'm going to turn it over to Don and, and okay. Helen because that was that's that's kind of one of their ideas that came up almost 18 months ago. So okay. Yeah. And I think part of part of that was driven by, and you see it a little bit when we talk about the research topics about how, how quickly that cycle time is on some of those mm -hmm. things. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, on the advisory board that the curricula associated with ICDT kept current, right? Because yes. cybersecurity concepts these days churn pretty fast, yes. right? And you know, uh, uh, you know this. Now it's zero trust. Who knows what it's going to be nine months from now, right? Or a week. Well, yeah, or a week. So, and, and we really said, and that's the reason why you see that industry advisory board ASAP was the, we really need to set up some structure because we can't say, because I think uh, the discussion last week was, well, what are the topics you'd want to focus on? And it, it quickly became the, hey, wait a minute, we need to set up a structure to periodically figure out what those topics are to make sure the curricula is anchored to something so that they're turning out people who have the knowledge that industry needs. Um, okay, I actually think it's it, it also has the opportunity to be bi-directional. So as, as someone who now sits in industry, I'm no longer at Ohio State, if you didn't know. Um, when you talk to industry people about whether a four-year degree or a master's or a PhD has value in terms of operationally supporting defense, cyber defense, I would tell you that most industry experts say you don't need a four-year degree. And in fact, a four-year degree may not be worth much, right? I think they're wrong. And I think if we had an industry um, advisory board, there's the opportunity to say, what does industry need from Ohio State? But there is also an opportunity to say, this is how higher ed works. This is the value higher ed brings. And how can industry take advantage of that? Because frankly, they just don't know how to take advantage of that, right? So I think it can be bi-directional that way too. Mm -hmm. All right, interesting. Well, I would be very interested to participate. So um, if there's opportunities, let me know. Julia's writing your name down, I think, <laughs> as you spoke. <laughs> You've been signed up, so it's <laughs> officially. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, yeah, Ted. Uh, no problem. I just want to uh, say that cybersecurity is weird because it's one of the few areas where the industry and the staff are really advanced in a lot of ways of fact. And that's not true for most areas. Um, uh, and so it's more than, it almost like bi-directional almost understates what we might want from the industry advisory board. Um, I mean, obviously stories are great, 
Of course, that could be embarrassing to you, but you could tell stories about other firms. Not your firm. um, and so stories would be great. Presentations about zero trust and what it means and the next flavor. You know, that that I think could be very helpful. I mean, obviously we have some real experts like Simon and some others that on, uh, you know, that know a lot of deep stuff, but even they might value. You see what I'm saying? That it, it's a little different than the other advisory boards in the sense that it could really be more than bi-directional. It could be like mainly the other directional. And then we talked about how we can sort of compensate the, the, the participants. Um, you know, obviously money would be great, but, but uh, we could also, you know, let them speak in our classes. And that was an interest. So, so that, that's just something I wanted to point out that it's more than, it's an unusual area. Yeah, I don't, Aaron, do you want to make any comments about uh, just this last semester? In fact, there was a little collaboration on a capstone class that went between Mattel and, and CSC and what Julia Yeah, uh, uh, really, really cool opportunity that uh, Julia reached out and we got to uh, basically propose a senior capstone project and then work with a group of students to see that to fruition. And we got to take one of the problems that we're actively working on at Mattel and give it to these students to, to kind of run with. Um, and that was a really good like medium to um, expose these students to the work that we do in the in the actual workforce, um, while at the same time giving them the ability to to learn in a you know safe environment. Mm -hmm. um, so, and at the end of it, you know, really happy about it. They they produce some really really awesome work um, that is is you know not something that they're just going to throw out and never look at again. It's something that they can actively put on the resume when they apply to do cybersecurity jobs in the future that people are going to be interested in seeing and hearing about. Um, and that, that worked out really well. And, and it, it is a great way to get industry involved in um, students earlier on outside of just you know internships and co-ops. Yeah, I watched the outbreak for that, and it was, it was, the students were just so excited uh, in the project that they did. I'm sorry, Cal. No, no, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know, how much time should we, is Rebecca, is she yeah, about ready yeah, about to? three minutes. Okay, okay, Kadir. Yes, yeah, so talking about the industries, we have, we are working with, let's say, Honda, and it's uh, Cummins, uh, all the topics that they bring up. Uh, we're dealing with mostly, let's say, masters of the stuff. And we see, let's say, industry has some immediate needs, which they want to address right now. And because of that, they have some learning how to avoid them in the future. So that goes into the research side. So we are, yeah, we are trying to engage uh, the industry force, getting some real challenges that we are facing. Uh, but sometimes there's a reluctance of what, to what extent we can uh, offer them or we can share the information with us. I'm not sure if Matt Apple is with you. Mm -hmm. yeah, so he was with us. Yep. He's now with the Super Hotel. He yeah. stole him from the academia. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was prepping him for PhD, but he jumped out of the master. Yeah. There Excellent. is a couple of comments in the chat. Oh, where'd it go? So um, from Artigure, industries in many ways are leading key research in cybersecurity. We might want to have a process to enable tech transfer from industry to extend our cybersecurity integration R&D, early integration to co-development with a valuable for TTM. Uh, or will be valuable, I, I apologize. Yeah. And Steve Vivek also says, one interesting aspect of cybersecurity and IT is that it permeates all OSU centers of activity, both in their own operations and in new mission opportunities. There are um, there may be other themes that also benefit from increased coordination among OSU centers. Yeah, and for those that don't know, Art Gore, so he uh, works with the Technology Commercialization Office here at Ohio State. So I work with him a lot. Yeah, Just a quick question for Don and Helen. So, like, so you guys mentioned that, that research topics change frequently. But so there's like the immediate research topics, but then there's kind of like the longer range stuff that you kind of see coming out. Like you kind of hear that Google flying physics departments so that they can hack quantum keys or cryptography. But yeah, how much are your particular companies focusing on those type of things that you know this might be a threat, you know, 10 years down, but not or 20 years down when like, <coughs> that next generation of computing thing is available rather than like 
<clears throat> so I think it depends on the vertical of the company. So, you know, now I sit at Cisco, for those of you who didn't know, Cisco sells security product as well as IT product and services. And they are very interested in those kinds of questions, right? Because developments in encryption, for example, are going to make redundant a lot of the current product that they sell. Depend, you know, how so there's a lot of overlap in the tech, you know, very much Silicon Valley sort of or or the North Carolina tech triangle, but you know, those kinds of places at looking forward into where's tech headed, where are the security controls headed, those kinds of things. If I go back to my role as CISO at Ohio State, from the point of view of administratively, does the security team have the resources to be thinking about what's coming 10 years from now? Hell no. Now, is there a partnership opportunity between you guys and the central security team? Probably, right? But I would say my experience as the OSU CISO is probably more indicative of everybody outside Silicon Valley, right? So, I, you know, if you think, talk to AEP, are they concerned about what encryption is going to look like in 10 years? Probably not so much, right? <laughs> but I think OSU has a role to play in talking about that. So we know CIOs across the country are like, well, hell, what does 5G mean for me in terms of just de delivering network? But the CISO then comes along and goes, well, what does that mean in terms of the security profile of my organisation if we adopt 5G or artificial intelligence or whatever, right? So I think the research side of OSU can be on the, dare I say, predictive side to be able to help people like me as an operational CISO think about how does this fit into my current risk profile and where do I need to be spending money? Um, yeah, and I would say that varies widely based upon the size of the firm. Mm -hmm. uh, you will find the Googles of the world and maybe the Cisco's of the world focused a little further down the path. You'll find in the financial services side of things, maybe that's the JP Morgan Chases of the world and some of those other folks. If you're a large regional like us, we're kind of looking down the road, but we're not spending a whole lot of time driving research in that space. We're kind of saying, yeah, I need to worry about you know quantum cryptography and what's that gonna do to all my digital certificates. And, and all of my encrypted traffic and things like that, but we're more a fast follower from that side of things. This is what I see in automotive side also. They say, no, they are not companies changing the topic. So whatever they will do, we'll just yeah, exactly. So, exactly. So. I think we've got one more question from um, our virtual attendant attendees. And then I think we're going to move on and hear from Dr. Michael. So um, Mike Beardry says, the most difficult task for um, advisors is getting students an internship to get the hands-on experience they need. How can we get businesses to create more opportunities like these? I actually think that's where the industry advisory board can help um, because we want to hear from industry in terms of what kinds of skills do they need before they can even bring an intern in. Um, but I think that that also flows sort of back the other way to say, what do we expect out of employers if they're going to have an OSU intern? What, you know, is it just someone shows up and sits in front of a monitor for eight hours and goes home again? Are they getting coffee or are they doing a full-blown project, capstone project that actually requires six years of higher ed experience already, right? So that's where I, I think that advisory board could be really really useful and, and I'll, I'll add because we need to go on to uh, to our next presenter but real, real quickly is that um, uh, Helen and I are both engaged at, with um, Cyber Ohio which part of Innovate Ohio which falls in the lieutenant governor's office and obviously the Ohio Department of Education for K through 12 and then ODHE for higher ed here in Ohio they're all very engaged at different levels when it comes to a lot of these things that we're talking about here I think again this you know, although it says industry advisory board, you know, it could potentially have be much broader than that. We could obviously and probably should engage representatives from some of the governmental organizations to make sure that we're addressing the needs and the issues of state, local, federal governments uh, in, in the issues that they have too, because they have some significant issues when it comes to finding the right kind of talent to fill a lot of these roles um, for that. So, all righty, we have to move on here. So it shouldn't be too hard. Uh, this morning, fresh from an early, early morning flight, please welcome Dean Ayanna Howard from the College of Engineering to our town hall today.
Um, so what I was asked to talk about during this, I guess, 15 minutes and then opening up for Q&A is really the importance of cybersecurity. Um, and when we think about cybersecurity, kind of the threats about what that looks like um, and its impact, its strength, and really the opportunities for growth in the College of Engineering. Um, so I will tell you, if this was maybe a year and a half ago, I mean, we all knew cybersecurity was important, but we didn't realize how utterly important it is to everything. And every time we log on now, where there's a Zoom, where there's audio, the fact is, is that we're opening up ourselves to vulnerabilities. And if you think about in terms of our education, there's been an increase and a rise in terms of our infrastructure, in terms of our even things, if you think about what just happened actually this week and last week around um, energy and gas and, and basically all of these things where we are opening up ourselves for, for these issues. Now, the problem is uh, a lot of these things, as you know, require one expertise. It requires, if you think about the types of things you're looking at, the types of data that you're looking at, the type of security, in some cases, clearance that you have to have. The fact is, is that a place at like Ohio State we are ideally positioned to really educate the next workforce. Um, if you look at our admits, both at the undergrad and grad level, we have such a nice mix of both domestic and international that it actually makes sense in terms of grooming and building the next generation of these professionals in this aspect. Um, and, and so what does this mean? So if you think about this aspect of cybersecurity, and I think of it as, as different threats. So there's a cybersecurity aspect that relates to artificial intelligence. There's a cybersecurity aspect that links to hardware. Um, I'm, I'm actually hopeful that we might have a chip plant now, uh, as was announced in terms of the US to actually get our capacity back up because we totally destroyed that. And then the third thing is thinking about how do we really provide the resources so that people, just everyday people understand what their role is in terms of protecting themselves. Um, you know, not using password, which is still the number one, I believe, password is password, um, right? Like getting people, not just our students, but really getting society really think about what is it when they're, when they're logging in, what is it that when they're thinking about? And so I would call it more of the social aspect of cybersecurity, because if you don't solve that, you also will increase your risk, right? So a lot of times you don't think about the users and the people, but they are actually the, the ones that provide the most open vulnerability. Even when you have a worker that fully understands everything, that goes into a skiff, that does everything, they always do that one little thing just because of the ease of use, and that's the understanding of human nature. And so that's really the third kind of prong of it. Um, and so talking about a little bit of the growth in College of Engineering and, and what we're looking at in terms of this enrollment, so we are tasked uh, at Ohio State to grow our enrollment. Um, roughly, it's about 1,600 in engineering, uh, net new graduates. Uh, just so you know, our current class of freshmen, uh, roughly, is will be admitting about 1,700, 1,800. So current, 1,700, 1, plus 1,600. Uh, that's a lot of, of growth. And it's very specific in terms of the kinds of fields. Uh, the fields that we're interested in is things that are computational. So around cybersecurity, around AI, around programming, things around electrical computer engineering, things around biomedical as well. Um, and then there are some other aspects that it's really focused on this aspect of computational skills that then can feed into all of these aspects. Um, so it's exciting, uh, but it also means that we also will be thinking about how do we design different types of educational programs. I want to design a system, and this is with some of the programs where we have a computer scientist that understands hardware, but also understands policy. Like, what does that look like in terms of our curriculum to actually allow that and not have them stay here for six years because we think that we have to give them all these courses and understand that. Um, one of the things as we talk to industry leaders is how do we give students the, the actual practice, the actual practicum, the actual experiential learning that they really do need, especially when you're talking about things related to cybersecurity, when you're talking about things related to data and real world environments and people, how do you provide the students that? So they, they go to class, they understand the theory, and maybe do these toy problems. But then when they go out into the real world, they actually have to do this entire learning process again, because now you're talking about real data, it's junky, it's ugly, it's messy, um, and there's this big gap. And so how do we also provide students with this in between? Because I really think it's the, us as a university to help provide that gap, but do it with respect to industry. 
we would like our freshmen to be able to go and work in an industry environment, work with a company. And yeah, we know they're freshmen, right? So they're still 19 years old, but how can we then put them and give them just enough so that they can be dangerous, but that they can learn in terms of on the job? And as a company, what kind of jobs can you task them with such that one, they're not critical path, but they're actually learning a skill set that they can then come back to the institution, come back into the classroom and cycle, cycle, cycle. And so all of this, of course, is like work in progress. We're iterating, we will be iterating and continuing so that at the end of our net new 1600 grads, that the students one will be not only understand the theory, but understand the practice of what they're doing. They will understand the role that they have in society in terms of all these aspects of cybersecurity, AI, medicine, health, energy, all these aspects where the students really wanna make a difference. Um, and then third, of course, is ensuring that we have a workforce that can actually work, a workforce that understands. And of course, we want to, at the end of the day, make sure that it represents the diversity that we have here in the nation, but also when possible internationally. Um, and so big, big goals. Uh, we've actually implemented some of them. I don't know if you talked about your new degree. We mentioned it and it won't be in detail. Okay, so there's, there's interesting things about a new degree programs, how do we do it as both a degree, but then how do we do elements of this for undergrads where we can actually do, think of it as doctoral modules, or um, if you think about, we have all these certifications, typically professionals have it, whether it's a Microsoft certification, but how can we construct these kind of modules for the students as well? Because at the end of the day, we can't extend their time, right? We already have them four years, you know, four and a half, we can't just say, well, you need to know, know more. So we're gonna add some more time. Well, you need to know more. We're gonna add more time. And that is actually non-negotiable. And so we really have to think about what this looks like and how we do it. Uh, but I'm excited. I'm excited about the intersection of cybersecurity. I'm an artificial intelligence person. So I'm really, really excited about the intersection with AI. And I'm also an educator. So I think about workforce development. I think about student needs. And I think about the opportunities for our students all of the time. Um, and so that's really where we are in terms of the College of Engineering, cybersecurity. It's right smack dab in the nice gem in, the, in this intersection of all of these things. Um, and the last thing I'm going to say, then open up for questions or Q&A, is um, one of the things that I look at a lot of programs and talking with Hesham and, and the other leadership is a lot of times when we design these programs, we think about it from the engineering perspective, computer science perspective. And we sometimes think about the other aspects. And I mentioned about the human aspect. Sometimes we think about the policy, We're like, yeah, we'll figure out the policy. Stuff. We, sometimes we think about the human, yeah, we'll figure out the human stuff. But I, I think it's really essential as we're designing, as we're growing, both from companies as well as government, from, as well as from the academic side, that we train our engineers and computer scientists in terms of these other fields. And we also train the students in these other fields to understand a little bit more about engineering and computer science. Um, I truly believe that when we do that, we will provide a real nice solution that again, you have your threads, you have your emphasis, you have your interest level, but you also understand how you fit in terms of the whole ecosystem um, in general. Um, so with that, it's one of the reasons why we are also interacting with College of Arts and Science, why we will be interacting with some of the other colleges because that's really the only way we can move forward, um, especially in this really critical area that um, kind of snuck up. I feel like it's snuck up. We've always been concerned about it, but I feel like in the last year and a half, like the need has become you know, almost an emergency uh, in that aspect. So I'm gonna open up if you have any questions uh, about the college, about the, the placement of cyber um, or anything in between. Do you currently have an internship program that focuses on the mechanics of engineering itself, not necessarily cyber? Um, so we have various programs. Uh, this is gonna be shifting. Uh, so we have centers like there's one called CDME, which is around manufacturing where students come, uh, companies identify a generic problem, like we're interested in X. Uh, the students are identified and they work in basically a team-based process um, and they're learning processing. So this is around many. So they're learning processing, they're learning logistics and things like that and doing that kind of thing. What we're interested in um, is, so I think hands-on. So I grew up where I started working for NASA when I was 18, 
right? And that was the only reason I stuck to engineering because I was like, oh, this is what real world looks like. And, and I totally believe in having that as opportunities. And so one of the things we're gonna do here is try to figure out how do we, um, and I mentioned like the freshmen, how do we provide freshmen from freshman year, the ability to work with companies and industries where we basically, we, we're paying them like a stipend, but the companies kind of pitch in as well, but they're not paying the, the standard rate. So one is students understand their value. Yes, you actually get paid to work. They can also, with the cohort, we can provide a little bit more mentorship so we can get them to actually be productive in some sense. Um, and we wanna do it around a certain phase. Uh, and so this full year, we're gonna start soliciting companies that are interested. And so there's a couple of things. So cyber is one, FinTech is another, uh, medicine is another, um, and they're basically, oh, and, and manufacturing mobility. Uh, so we're gonna start doing pilots this year to basically kind of work out the kinks. Um, so if any companies who are here are interested or online, uh, we, we are actually looking and soliciting companies that are interested and in, in really working with us to define what this looks like. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Dwayne Wagner. I'm from the psychology department. So a lot of what you had to say is music to my ears. Uh, and I, uh, I'm happy to talk more about how we can, can interact in those ways, but I'm just wondering what initial thoughts you have about how we can take the human behavior side of things and integrate it with the technology side of cybersecurity. Yeah, so there's some interesting research that I've um, looked at, for example. Uh, so one is uh, human, human characteristics. Uh, there's a, something to be said about peer pressure. So there has been studies, for example, that shows that if you have a, a well-respected influencer that actually talks about, you know, they're protecting themselves online, that their followers are more likely to think about it, right? And so there's, I mean, it's, it seems so like, yeah, that makes obvious sense. But then the question is, is how do you get the influencer? How do you, how do you in terms of the research, how do you actually identify these threads so that you can actually get into other communities? Uh, how do you identify the hotspots and figure out how do you get into these hotspots and what are these linkages? So that's just an example of something that's like, oh, that seems simple, but it's actually fairly complicated. Yeah, I was thinking more about the educational side of things because that's exactly the kind of research that I do. But um, so, but but yeah, we, we can talk more later, that's fun. Yeah, so in terms of education, um, we're sort of looking like, so I, I do artificial intelligence, I do ethics and artificial intelligence. Um, and I, we have to think about how we ensure that our students are responsible engineers and computer scientists when they graduate. I mean, the studies show that, you know, they come in as high schoolers, and this is not just at Ohio State, but they come in as high schoolers, you know, they want to save the world, and then by the senior, they're like, okay, where's my job and how much can I make? And, and something about the way we do education, it really focuses them in terms of a different way, and I think it's detrimental, it's why every time you look at the news, it's something bad, right? Like, so-and-so is destroying the world and things like that, and it's because I think it's, we just lose that sense of our role in society. Um, and so we're going to start looking at how do we design this? Because it's not like we have to teach them this, is that we have to make sure that we can nurture it as a, to be an engineer, responsibility should be your first tenant, not your second or your third or your fourth. That would go along with education. I have one from our online audience. Um, a comment slash suggestion for early involvement for quote, naive IT people is to engage in FOSS, FOSS, free and open source software early. It provides a framework for learning and contributing with more expert and skilled I, I think IT people. It also fits very well with OSU land grant mandate to contribute to its community. OSU could become a powerhouse in IT by contributing to meaningful um, open source projects that are usable by industry to provide for IT functions and security features. Question, is that direction part of the current vision? Um, so open source is uh, a challenge depending on the application. So for education, open source is, in fact, the students will tell you, uh, we, we have this sanctioned you know, software that they're supposed to use and they use it for their assignments, but they then go off and use something else to actually learn. And I mean, we know this, we know this and we just put a blind eye. Um, and so that's gonna happen. Uh, where the difficulty comes is, is when we are trying to design software, especially if it's around cyber, that can be used outside of the educational structure and the framework. Uh, because what happens is um, open source is a community-based effort, which means that 
everyone is contributing to it, which means that you have people who are not trained to design the software without the loopholes and the vulnerabilities. And so any company that then adopts it, they are also adopting the risk. Uh, and, and so that becomes a problem. So having open source in terms of, you know, playing with it, learning with it is fine for the students, but there is still not enough development, there's not enough ownership of open source software for some of these high critical needs. Um, I don't ever see something that's open source being used on a drone that's going overseas. I just don't see that, right? Now, having drone research that's done in Ohio State where we're trying to figure out how do we navigate and deliver medical supplies, like that's fine because we're not worried that someone's gonna hack it and you know something bad happens. Um, and so there's this boundary condition of when open source is good versus when it just, we just don't have the structure, we don't have the ownership for it to be, um, able to be deployed in a, in a reasonable manner. So I in the first welcome, I, I, I don't know if everybody knows, but welcome to ICID. This is actually my first time to see you in person. So yes. welcome. <laughs> I, everybody is extremely excited about working with you. So, um, I think it's, it's quite assuring to everybody in the room to see that cybersecurity is a central part of your vision for, for engineering. And you have also indicated you believe that it has to cross boundaries between colleges. And that's actually, I think, something that everybody in the room is excited about. Now, I know you've been here only for a couple of months, but Ohio State is a huge place. And um, everybody wants to work with everybody. But usually we face issues when we start to make that happen, which are practical or bureaucratical, like budget models teaching roads, all kinds of stuff that you know about. So maybe I, I would say my, my, my wish is to hear from you that in the short period you've seen, have you, is, is discussion starting at the level, <laughs> at the dean level, that makes you optimistic that this time we can do this at a structural level or it's too early to judge? Because faculty and, and staff and students want to do this. And usually the barriers are, are not at that level. Usually you break up for no one's fault, but just structures that are not designed for that. So that's my question. Yeah, so I, I think uh, one of the things, and this is just more general, is so there's a lot of new deans at, uh, at Ohio State, um, and most of us are from external. So we have no preconceived notions about you know, what are these barriers, uh, which actually helps because we have no preconceived notions. And so one of the things that I do see, but I will say as a caveat, it's a, there's a lot of things going on here. There's things from, you know, very, very small initiatives to large university-wide initiatives. And, you know, what's been going on is identifying, you know, a few, I mean, N is more than one or two, but identifying a few and getting those through. And as we get those through, because there's, there is a focus and there's a focus across at least four of the colleges in some cases and in other cases, seven. Um, it's like, okay, here's, we're all interested in this. Let's push this forward. And as we're doing that, we're starting to notice, oh, well, this has to be fixed, this has to be fixed. Now caveat, it may not fix it in terms of general, but that's the way that it's been going now. Um, so I'm hopeful uh, because I actually still don't see any barriers. I just see workarounds right now. And I think all of us, because we're coming from the outside, we just see, oh, okay, maybe not this way. Maybe it's this way. And then it happens. Any other questions? Yes. I'm Ken Allen. I'm from Industrial Engineering. And you said that we're doing okay in terms of our diversity and, and we want, but the thing is, now, if, if the whole college has, is sort of desperate for any student to get more, and you know, I wonder if you could have any initiatives at the, co at the college office to really improve diversity. And, and to me, a big part of that is about topic selection, uh, because some topics may resonate better with different communities. And particularly at the graduate level, you know, it's, it's just, we have not been very successful so far. But we're changing, but just saying that, uh, do you have any thoughts about what you could do or as a, you know, as a dean to, to really make a sort of structural difference in our recruiting? Um, yes. So one of the things that I've noticed over the last three months is that um, the, the typical attitude at Ohio State has been they will come, right? So there really hasn't been a lot of recruiting. 
it's 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 you know kind of like same school, but it really hasn't been a lot of recruiting. Uh, but the time has changed. There's a lot more competition now, especially when students don't even necessarily know really what engineering and computer science is, right? And so it's not just competition in terms of other universities. It's also competition of you know should I go into this field? Like why do I even need it? Um, and so we're going to actually start doing a lot more in terms of recruiting and marketing. And I always say, like Apple still advertises, right? Like as big as they are, Amazon still advertises. So if these huge companies that basically kind of almost rule the world are still marketing, still advertising, still recruiting, then why are we not doing this? Um, and so we're gonna start doing things both at the undergrad level for grad, um, as well as the, um, I don't wanna say K through 12, high school, there's, so there's other stuff, but I just want to have some low-hanging fruit things that we can do, uh, high school to the undergrad level um, around this aspect. And so I, I think we can do it. Um, it's going to require us, you know, as we expand our numbers, we're also going to expand the standard deviation of the um, background of these students. Not that they're not smart, because they're going to be smart, they're going to be testing well, but, you know, my AP calculus is not going to be the same as someone else's AP calculus. And so at the institution, we are going to have to figure out the scaffolding. In fact, this summer, we have a pilot, uh, basically pre program around sophomores to actually see how can we fill in the gap for students we've identified that seem to be struggling a little bit in terms of their freshman year and give them a little bit more cohort support so that when they go into their sophomore year, they're like basically on par with, with everything else because it's not about the students, it's about the background. And we're not gonna fix that, at least in the United States, but what we can fix is when they're here, we can make sure that they succeed. So. <clears throat> Excuse me, you talk about uh, experiential, experiential learning. And I, I would like to know what, what does engineering want to be? Um, so if we want to be uh, training security researchers, I think we're, we're relatively well set up for that. If we want to be training security practitioners, I'm not sure that we're well set up for that. If you look at uh, departments like uh, dentistry, right? They operate the dentistry faculty practice. Um, I think psychology does similar things. There are people who actually practice clinical yeah, clinics. Um, do we have plans to, to, uh, to do actual clinical activities with the, the faculty in engineering? Uh, for cybersecurity theories? Yes, um, not necessarily the faculty, but the uh, students and probably, I mean, we need instructors. So they may most likely be clinical faculty that will be involved with that. Um, so some concepts are, and this won't be this summer, this will be next summer, is starting boot camps around. And I would just tell you, it's because companies have been coming to us and saying, we love your graduates, but we still have to train them. Right, because they're looking for practitioners. Uh, and so we're actually working with at least two, we're gonna expand that in terms of a boot camp where they're gonna be given like real worlds, very so much like the, I mentioned with the with CDME with the undergrads, but you know, real world company identified where you know, if you can't pass their test in terms of entry into that company, we've got a problem. And so what is it that you need in terms of training? And you're correct. So one of the things is uh, College of Engineering we are part of the professional deans. The professional deans, it's law, right? It's business and it's engineering. And yet we don't do the same thing as these professional schools. And yet that's what we're considered. Uh, and so we do have to do a lot more because we're great on the research side, but not everyone wants to be a researcher. And there's so many opportunities that are out there in terms of the spectrum of engineering that we have to provide that. And I will say the demand is there from companies and we're gonna provide it. Hey Howard, I have a question, just to follow on to this same question here. In general, applied research is a very expensive type of research. And to my 11 years that I've seen in Ohio here, the applied aspect has been to some degree minimized because it's costly. You know, the, the college has to spend a lot of money that even the startup uh, goes up. I mean, there's just a lot of factors that impact that. So how do you see driving that aspect back into the college okay, to happen? Yeah, so it's, it's across board, correct? I mean, it, it has to do with labs. It has to do with 
you know, people getting, you know, experiments to be done while doing their studies and kind of restructuring even the curriculum around that is going to have, has to change from where we have to. So how do you see this happening in the future? Yeah, so um, if there's been a bunch of conversations, uh, mostly from President Christina Johnson um, and just a bunch of her initiatives. And so if you look at it, uh, the last number was about 350 new faculty net. Um, again, 2000 new students, about 1600 will most likely come from engineering. And so if you, you do the numbers, 350 you deduct it, that tells you how many new faculty we will be hiring in engineering. Um, now caveat, some of those will be cross, so there'll be joint positions, not all of them, but some of them will be joint positions. Um, you know, College of Arts or College of uh, Arts and Science and things like that. Uh, so resources. So there's a couple of uh, lines of resources that are coming to Ohio State and the college. So one is around Jobs Ohio, uh, which is basically they're the ones that came and said we want all these new graduates because we are not producing them. And so there are resources that are associated with that for faculty, for academic advisors, for support, GTA support, and things like that. So that's one thread. Uh, the other thread is um, around a couple of initiatives, Innovation District, which is also Jobs Ohio. It's about this concept of, um, there's some spreadsheet that says, if you bring in this person and at this lab and they're in cybersecurity example, this is how much funding is because we just saw the bill that's coming out of DC, then in at least three years, this is the amount that we should have in terms of revenue to then kind of support. And so all of these models are going on. Uh, I will tell you, there's a little bit of a deficit uh, and so we look at it and we can make the 350, we can get to the 2000. There's a slightly deficit, which means that all of us deans are really on the road a lot, uh, trying to raise in terms of that deficit. Uh, because the one thing we can't do is of course, increase tuition, right? And so that deficit has to be made by doing things like joint programs with companies that want to do an internship program where they support some of their aspects of the students. And then we can convert that to actually giving scholarships for tuition and things like that. Um, so all of these things, which is different than I think in the past, is that it's not just that we're going to do all of this, but there's actually resources that are part of the strategic thinking of how do we actually do this in, in, a, in a much more systematic way, uh, because you can't, it's not, it's, it's not going to be a zero sum game, it's actually a growth game. Resources, faculty, students. So it's exciting. Other questions? Let me check online. I don't think we have any other online. Um, so I will, we're going to adjust our schedule a little bit, but thank you so much for thank being you. here. Thank you. Like I said, if there's any companies that are interested in doing this, I'm that are interested in things like internships or interested in things about what kind of boot camps or what kind of curriculum changes, definitely contact either Julia or Hesham and because we actually are meeting, I think, in a few weeks to talk about strategy. So thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great one. Um, so unfortunately, Becca had to move on to some other her very busy day, um, but she has requested that uh, some of the OCRI content be covered after lunch, um, Bob, in your session with Ted. So I'll pass the message along as well. Um, so that means up next will be Alam talking about this curricular program. So quite actually a <laughs> gratuitous segue. Um, make sure you're all set. <clears throat> oh, Alam, I lied. Um. Okay. Maybe, maybe Sam just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I don't want to go. Okay. In fact, I was just going to say You're going to tell me I was fine. I was just about this game. <laughs> <laughs> My brain. Thank you for your patience. Um, so this, this session is uh, with Helen Patton, our Ohio State, um, I, don't, I don't know the appropriate word. I think it's Ohio State industry person <laughs> wearing multiple hats um another one of which she's going to talk about this morning so last week we had our session on outreach and events which kind of fits in that engagement bubble um and we we crossed over with industry a lot in our conversations so i'll, I'll point some of that out but mostly we'll focus on the the other sides so the goals for that day were just to try to identify the community on and off campus who are interested in playing in this space and usually have some uh, something to offer, something to benefit from the relationship. 
also wanted to kind of map the current landscape and identify the opportunities of where we want to move forward based on the strengths of the university um, and where we want to go in next year. So this is just a quick screenshot. I'm sure you can't read all the details and that's all right. But to, to get an idea of, we started with the audiences. So what's our outreach and engagement like our events for students, for Ohio State employees, and for the greater Columbus and Ohio community. As you can see, the student bubble is, is pretty filled up and that's, uh, that's, there's a lot of activity going on in there. We have a cybersecurity club, women in cybersecurity club, the OHIO program, faculty advisors who are working with those students. So there's plenty, plenty of room for growth, but a lot going on in that area. There's a really cool event every fall called Cybersecurity Days focused on the Ohio State employees. Um, I think Reg Jackson might even be on the line listening to me talk. So Reg, you can jump in. <laughs> and uh, down in the Columbus community, some of those boot camps and the curricular classes, which engage not only it, it, not the curriculum from the formal perspective, but that boot camp to try to engage a uh, workforce development in career transitioners or upskilling and some, some crossover areas. So interesting to me was that after reviewing some of that, um, the, the uh, K-12 space kind of kept popping up in teacher education in K-12. So I'm going to talk about that after Helen mentions or uh, describes our cybersecurity canon, I'm not sure everybody is aware. So I wanted to give her a few minutes to talk about this work that she's been doing for years, a couple of years, couple of years. Uh, and you can find it on the icdt.osu.edu page. Um, but Helen, you want to hit the yes. next slide for me? Sure. All right. Um, so hi, everyone. For those of you who don't know, uh, I used to be the CISO at Ohio State. Uh, three months ago, I left. I'm now an advisory CISO at Cisco. Um, while I was the CISO at Ohio State, I ran into this guy by the name of Rick Howard. Rick was the Chief Information Security Officer for Palo Alto Networks. Um, and a few years ago, he realized that there was, if you're a professional in cybersecurity, there was no place that you could go to get really good materials about being a cybersecurity professional. So he created this thing called the Cybersecurity Canon. Um, and there, it is a website that has a whole list of books that have been read, reviewed, and recommended for the Canon. Um, but it is also a committee of professionals in the cybersecurity industry who are part of that committee that do that work. Um, within a given year, a number of books would be read and reviewed. And then depending on the quality of the book, they may be recommended to become a Hall of Fame nominee. And once a year, the committee votes to decide whether or not a book should indeed be inducted into the Hall of Fame. So I think Football Hall of Fame or Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, sort of same general idea, right? If something is Hall of Fame worthy, it is perceived to be something that is of such a topic, of such an enduring topic, that absence of knowledge about that topic would be perceived to be a gap in a cybersecurity professional's um, knowledge. So there you go. Um, so that's that's sort of how that works. Um, there's a committee, we do things. By the way, anyone can read a book and do a review and submit it for awards. So it is certainly something our students could think about. Perhaps it could get incorporated into a class, either for credit or for not credit. Um, a cybersecurity professional could do it, an academic could do it. Most of the books are professional books. We don't actually, this is not a peer review academic sort of paper kind of place. On the other hand, if there is an academic paper that you think every cybersecurity professional should read, I would love to know about it. So um, send it my way. Why is this important for ICDT? Um, Ohio, so let me go back a bit. Rick Howard left Palo Alto. And when he did, this is always the way in cybersecurity, when he did, Palo Alto said, we don't want to be the host of this anymore. And so Rick went looking for a new home right when ICDT was starting. And I went, we'll take it, right? Um, what does this get us? So first of all, all of a sudden, OSU is now associated with something that is well known in the cybersecurity industry, right? So we automatically get reputational benefit for housing the canon, okay? 
Second of all, um, the Canon is starting to partner with other cybersecurity professional organizations. So ISSA, which has a huge Columbus chapter, and by the way, in May, they have a conference that has over 900 people attend it. And next year, they're gonna be hosting the international mm -hmm. conference, right? So again, there's partnership opportunities for our students, for our faculty, um, and the industry representatives that are part of ICDT to be part of that. In addition, the people who write the books they win things, and when they win things, they like showing up to collect their awards. So we have the option of bringing some of those authors to Ohio State for professional speaking series, right? Um, here's some examples of the books that have won over the last couple of years. So if you're into disinformation, if you haven't read Like War, read Like War. Have you read it? Have you read that book? It's sort of amazing, actually. Blew my mind. Um, Code Girls, if you're into history, Sandworm, if you're into sort of malware kind of nation state kinds of things, Call of the Dead Cow, if you're into the history of weirdo hackers going back through the ages, um, Zero Trust Networks, if you want to sort of think about networking, right? Again, all of these books are on the Cyber Cannon website. You can go see them all. Um, and this is just from the last couple of years. It's, I think the first book that was inducted into the Hall of Fame was uh, the cuckoo's egg, which, by the way, when I talk to the cybersecurity industry and they say, how relevant is academia? I point them to that book and say, we wouldn't have the internet. We wouldn't have hacking. We wouldn't have this kind of stuff if it wasn't for academics, right? Um, so this is what the canon's all about. We are hoping to continue our partnership with it. So as we think about the role of ICDT going forward, we want to be able to do this and grow it. Um, and we have amazing students who are helping us, Cal, Nyla, and others, uh, to keep the website going, to make it relevant. And we also have a social media presence for the Cyber Canon as well. So you can follow the Canon on Twitter or LinkedIn. I think there's Twitter and LinkedIn, right? Yeah. So that's the Canon. Any questions on that? If you are interested in reading a book, doing a review, or getting more information, let me know. Happy to share. Thank you. Yep. Um, so the, the canon is one glowing, shining example of ways to engage a broader audience. Um, and we had a wonderful discussion over 90 minutes. And these were kind of like Mark did this morning, some of our big takeaways. Um, high school outreach, as I mentioned, kept coming up as well as teacher training. Um, and I think this is an example of where you start to see that crossover in those domains. Like, well, how are we going to get students to enroll in a higher ed academic curriculum and into workforce development if we're not recruiting them and helping them um, from high school and even earlier years? How about teacher training? I mean, right now, there was a, a lot of talk around computer science curriculum in the state of Ohio for um, high schoolers and that's just now being developed and how is it going to progress um, and can we have a role in that? Uh, we also talked about the research areas. What if? What about faculty entrepreneurship? There's a lot uh, of seeds in this area, startups and companies that are being built. How does that interact with our, what our faculty is doing? Uh, what about faculty are starting their own companies and can we support that? How about other, and then I, th I think this is probably a, a common point, but at least it was discussed also that day, beyond engineering. What about all the ac other academic units on campus? Um, whether that's some simple relationships or more explicit integrations and in programming. Um, and the important of human dynamics. That wasn't, <laughs> the interesting part about human dynamics is it wasn't, let's talk about this for 10 minutes. It's that it kept coming up every five or 10 minutes. Oh, well, and the human dynamics of this aspect or the human dynamics when we talk about cybersecurity of high schoolers. What about um, how employees are engaging with this or that? And so that was just um, worth a bullet point because it was such a common thread. So from those, uh, a few objectives for next fiscal year. Uh, we can't do much outreach if nobody knows who we are. So let's improve our communications, websites, newsletters, the uh, social media accounts, how do we make our website a useful tool and a resource? Um, there was some conversation from faculty about 
you know, where do I go to find information, not about information to find information, but actual content? And can we host learning content or, or links to learning content, um, not somebody's name? The second item there, support formalizing the industry advisory board, which uh, was, was talked about this morning, and how can we weave that into the Institute and across campus relationships um, so that it's not just this group of people that meets and talks for every, you know, every quarter, but makes some real impact and is a beneficial relationship for all involved. Partly on workforce development, partly on that formal learning. So bringing more capstone projects in or formalizing internship programs, um, as well as the research areas. So you, you need a team to, to do research and how, how are you gonna build that team? Um, the third bullet, support each technical pillar. So this afternoon, you'll be talking a little bit more or we'll hear the report outs from some of those other sessions um, in the very, various technical areas. How can we continue to support we meeting outreach engagement, um, supporting from the kind of bringing the support around the deep dive. So if, if this is the breadth, that's the depth. Um, and then let's let's do this again next spring. Let's come back together and have another town hall and annual report. So <laughs> I guess if I can back up one and take questions before maybe I'll stand up for a third time. <laughs> so why haven't we tried to rope in the college uh, outreach. I mean, because uh, the college has a guy who tweets all the time. He could tweet about us. He could he could put stuff on our, you know, maybe we should get mm -hmm. those guys to help us. Yeah, I the forgot. college has marketing, various yeah. people in different departments do it as well. I think we need to make the first move. Yeah. yeah. All right, I've seen uh, industry advisory board mentioned a couple different times. Is it the same? Yes, ABD? yes. Okay. It just keeps just making sure coming up. Keeps yeah. <laughs> Same one. <clears throat> Cal, anything online? All right. Question. Tell me how connected we are with the, the school boards within the state of Ohio, for example. Do you see us, you know, well entrenched into them, kind of looking at their culture and seeing how can we actually actively participate in their <laughs> Or do you see them operating kind of in silos? Uh, I mean, a lot of us have high school kids and a lot of us, you know, have people in the middle school and elementary even. And uh, at least from my experience, I have not seen an imprint of uh, us as Ohio State into these, uh, you know, school boards. And I've been into two different school boards, so it's not just one that I'm pointing out to. Mm -hmm. so, but I, I, just, I was going to say, I, I personally do not, and I don't have any observation of it, although I do um, have contact with our state super, superintendent as well as teachers. So sort of on the bookends of the school board perhaps, but Helen? Yeah, so, and Mark probably has a perspective on this as well. So as part of Innovate Ohio and the Cyber Ohio board, we've been, there's been a working group around computer science uh, curriculum in high schools. What came out of that to me uh, quite in my face was one, every high school has its, every school board has its own curricular development. There is no sort of consistency around what goes into individual classes and class curricula. Um, the Ohio Department of Education does sort of set minimum standards, but they are just that, they are minimum standards. Um, Code.org, you can go check out code.org code online. They've assessed every, state in the country around their computer science curricula and there's only 42 percent of Ohio's high schools and this is reflective of the average across the U.S. 42 percent offer at least one computer science class in high school one right and so part of the work that is being done at the Ohio level is to raise that percentage, but also be able to provide guidance to students and teachers around what they should be looking for and what should be included in the curricula. So I think there's the time is right now for Ohio State to engage in those discussions. 
but up until this point, I don't think there has been a forum for engagement that would be across the state. Thank you, Helen. Okay. Oh, Go I on. just want to make a comment about that. I, I Bimmel is on the Ohio Cyber Council Education. Oh, group. then I could be completely wrong. Right, Bimmel? <laughs> so you're you're kind of on that. That's your thing. Aren't you hanging out with superintendent? I mean, Ted, you're confusing OC3's education workforce with what Helen's talking about. Oh, so, so it's different. It's I totally apologize. different. Uh, no, yeah. This is what makes it confusing. There are lots of efforts yeah. that are sort yeah. of, if, if cyber education is an elephant, we've all touching the elephant at different places and we have a different idea of what the <laughs> elephant actually is. That's where we're at at the moment. So yeah. one, of, one of the things that, that OCRI was kind of focused on with that cyber range was not just kind of as a range for for higher ed, but also for K through 12. Yeah, so and really the teacher about, training, right. Uh, mm -hmm. Developing modules for that. And I think, I think Ted was even kind of working on some modules that might target K through 12. Um, and then I think there was also that kind of, Helen's bigger point, each school could be like different. <laughs> so I think they were looking at possibly utilizing some of those resources to build like portfolios of packages so that you could kind of see, store them on that resource and kind of see them can you standardize a little bit yeah. and teach everybody similar so skills? There is a proposal going into the next state of Ohio budget, which is currently under debate, right? So I don't know how much will last. Um, one, to offer an online class for computer science, again, not cybersecurity, but computer science that could be taken through the, um, oh crap, you know the program where kids in high school can take college level classes? Help me. AP. Yes, yeah, secondary PSEOP yeah, exactly. or college plus. It's college credit oh, class thing. Yeah. So they could take it as a college credit plus class for an online computer science class. So if their particular local high school doesn't have faculty or teachers who could teach the class, they could take it online for that credit. Um, and uh, it, it also established, I, I don't know what the practical reality of this is actually, to be honest. It establishes a right to a computer science education for every student in K through 12. So the intent is not just for high school, but middle school and K through and, and elementary school training over time. Um, whether it lasts in the budget proposal or not is a different question. So watch that space. This is an excellent idea, Helen. I, I think one of the problems that we don't kind of pay attention to is that high schoolers have also the same problem that we have in colleges. We have a set of yes. predetermined uh, things that you have to uh, study. And now when it comes to that, you are within an elective of an elective Yes. at that point. And yes. when, when you are within an elective of an elective, by that time, your percentage of students are going to actually go towards computer science, no matter what you do, within the structure of a high school is going to be visible yep. at that point. Yes. The only way to fix this in my mind is to look for after school activity. Mm -hmm. So looking at weekends, looking at summer, like how actually right now, yep. kids are not doing anything in there. Online is a beautiful idea you know, to kind of propagate that education different from within the hours of the school because they have only six period of classes and they're all booked. And this is a problem that we have in Ohio, that I've been in other states that don't have that kind of rigid restriction, but the schools here have this, you know, structured way. And by that time, you're looking at less than 5% students basically. It's going quite to computer late. Science. So I think some of the work that, you know, the Hack Ohio programs and stuff do, I think can lend itself particularly into the cybersecurity side. The other thing that the legislation is proposing is that, um, and I'm sure there's lots of debate about the pros and cons of this, but um, that colleges in the state of Ohio will accept computer science as a language in terms of um, requirements. Uh, so again, so it's sort of that question of we don't want you to take a language and a computer science class, but you can use one for the other. So that's also written into the the curriculum, uh, the legislation as well. So to again, your we'll point, see what actually makes it. There's a couple of comments and there's a question uh, in the chat as well. Anna Marwood says, um, outreach to scouting schools, clubs, and 4-H or other after school programs extensions is is something that perhaps we should be looking into. And then John Muir would like to ask the advisory board, is there a possibility of expanding this coordination beyond capstone and things like internships into a deeper curriculum input? If the churn is real in terms of currency of information and there's a tremendous benefit for authentic real world scenarios for assignments and projects, is there an opportunity to identify key courses and embedded assignments up and down these curricula 
that would benefit from regular suggestions from industry partners. Would certainly require a lot of faculty buy-in and time, but even just updating project scenarios and things every year might be important. Yeah, I would agree with that. Would agree. Suggestion. Yeah. And to your point, the, uh, the, ex the hands-on learning, the experiential learning, um, and as much as we can try to inject into the classroom formally and keep it updated, well, we can do a great job and we can still be losing at the same time. And so offering online options or industry coming in to give those workshops, this is why oh, OHIO does what it does, right? You know, <laughs> oh, now we have a new language. Let's learn Elixir. Oh, let's do this. Oh, you want to know what blockchain is? If that wasn't covered in your sophomore foundations class, let's do it here. Um, and so giving students the, the opportunity to pick and choose what they want to learn is as important, perhaps, as keeping, keeping our courses relevant. Um, Julia, it's, like, can, it's constantly chasing them. Like it is. And I'll, this is kind of pile on a little bit while even you were talking about. So one of the things that we ran up against when I first started Ohio Cyber Collaboration Committee, um, and I went out and I talked with a number of superintendents around the state. I talked to principals. I talked to the folks that work in the education service centers. And the, the standard response that I got from virtually everybody was, we have so much stuff already that we have to, that we're required by law to pack into, you know, the students' curriculum that we just can't add anything else. There's just no way we can do it unless the General Assembly is willing to take off some of these requirements. And that I don't think will ever happen, at least not in the near future uh, for it. So one of the things that, that we did do was we worked with um, uh, some of the members of OC3, one of the individuals, and I'm not sure if he's still online, but John Hogue, who uh, before he left um, OU to move to Virginia, worked with the Ohio Department of Education to put together a um, cybersecurity club uh, kit. So it's, it's all done, it's online. Any, any STEM teacher at any school, it could middle school, high school, whatever, that wants to start a cyber club, it's already done right there on the ODE's website and it steps them through how to do it and how to get engaged in that. I will, I will tell you the sort of the flip side of that coin though that I ran up against a lot of times is that there are very few sort of quote unquote STEM teachers in K through 12 that understand cybersecurity, right? They know math, they know science, they don't necessarily have any expertise whatsoever when it comes to how do you how do you sort of take that to this next level to help educate these kids or even just to get them interested, right? I mean, Dr. Howard talked about, you know, the university is in College of Engineering's piece of uh, what they're supposed to be doing over the next 10 years is to increase by 1600 graduates, right? Well, at some point you do have to go do recruiting and you do have to get kids that are in middle school and high school interested in these different types of career fields out there and, and doing that. And so this this cyber kit, club kit, was one way to try to just get, you know, uh, get that interest level up. Now, the other piece of this is, and I don't know if Bob is going to talk a little bit about it, was, so the Ohio Cyber Reserve, which is run by the Adjutant General's Department, is a part of OC3, and, and part of their charter for the individuals that are part of the Cyber Reserve is to go out and work with high school STEM teachers and to help educate them on cybersecurity and, and the things you know, that they need to know to be able to help this youth on these kinds of programs to get that interest level up. So there, and, and of course, I know this all comes to, everybody is so busy, it's difficult to get all this information out you know, in the right place to the right people to sort of build uh, upon some of the things that everybody is talking about here today. But I, I will, I mean, I'll be happy if anybody wants to reach out to me, I'd be happy to connect you to all the people that are running these programs. Bob Pardee is part of the Ohio Cyber Reserve. He'd be happy to connect you into that program, you know, if you're interested in learning more about that. So there's, there is a ton of opportunity. And I think this is kind of goes back to sort of what Hesham talked about it, which was the founding in ICDT is, is you know, there is, there's so much that can be done uh, and ICDT at Ohio, you know, at a university like Ohio State, at least in my opinion, right, is is perfectly positioned to be able to champion a lot of these causes, you know, and and get that word out and work with industry and things like that to try to help 
you know, uh, the, the citizens of the state of Ohio, if nothing else, right, become more educated on cybersecurity um, for that. So I think you touch on a very good point because um, uh, a few months ago, I actually talked to the superintendent, uh, particularly about the computer science class, because that's a class that's offered in the Columbus, even though it's, a, you know, a, a Dublin school, but it's all offered in Columbus. And I asked, why can't you have a teacher? He said they have two years been looking for a teacher to teach computer science, they cannot, because the pay scale, yeah. they cannot exceed a certain, they up it to the maximum allowed within the, the school district. And even with that, they cannot find anybody that is willing to accept that kind of a pay scale to do that job. Yeah. Uh, for, so this points out to a fundamental problem that we're not going to solve here, unless we kind of come up with our own kind of version of establishing a solid education program within Ohio State that caters and basically hires people and grow people within that realm and service the school districts. Yeah. Within the school districts is not going to, I mean, he, right. he just pointed yeah. out, he said, I, I have a pay scale, the, the, the state kind of caps me, I cannot go beyond that level. And with that, yeah. it's been so, two years. So real quick, so I'll, I'll, I'll provide just two, two opinions right on that. So one opinion that, that, that I have is that, that the here at Ohio State anyways, and really all of higher ed, is that in the departments or the colleges that are putting that, are developing new teachers, they should be teaching cybersecurity as part of a foundational skill for those teachers. I don't, I don't care whether you're going to go do phys ed or whether you're, you know, you're going to be a math teacher. You should have at least some foundational understanding of why cybersecurity um, is important for that. The other opinion that I'll throw out is that, so we have a lot of master's and PhD candidates, right, that are doing work here. Why not make part of their program a little bit of public service? And that's to go into the high schools or middle schools and, and do a semester where they help set up maybe a cyber club or they help educate the, the STEM teachers that are at that school in those districts. You know? And it would be either very low cost or no cost would be the ultimate, right? Uh, probably for those school districts to do that. I can guarantee you they would jump all over something like that. Beautiful. But, but, it, but it requires you know, uh, something like an Ohio State who's the flagship university of this state to, to sort of be the one to lead that kind of effort, I think. So one college we haven't engaged with ICDT is EHE. So we should just probably make a note to get them on board. Yeah, and, and I have some updates from- um, You have time for another comment, Julia, is time Very to quick, we, we <laughs> definitely have to move on or we're not eating lunch today. I'll give you a primer. You already know about a lot of these things in the, in the K to 12 realm, maybe a level down from affecting the school boards and curriculum, but a little more tangible on the ground things. I come from the mobility world um, and at the Center for Automotive Research, we have more than 20 years of doing K to 12. One thing I observed is scalability was a real challenge though, that the standard model is interns, great program. You can do an amazing job, have them for the summer. We find ways to fund them, but beyond 10, 15, 20, it's just a huge burden. You can't reach the masses. So just uh, three really quick programs that I think we could kind of directly copy the model and, and involve industry in a huge way. Um, one was tapping into the foundation. So for example, we work with uh, GM's foundation. Almost every corporate foundation now has STEM education as part of it. Um, they provide, let's say, something on the order of a $50,000 grant. I think we've gotten about eight years in a row, and we give that to graduate student teams, and they get to put that right into their research programs and support them, um, and we take their time to develop modules. We do an eight-week program. Um, this one's limited to regional, obviously, because the, the students have to come, um, but they come for eight weeks for like four hours on Thursday evening, so you're in the extracurricular, and this is high school targeted. Um, and the students run them through things they're doing in their research. A professor oversees it, but it's grad students putting the other curriculum and modules, and we're running a couple hundred students through that program, so you start to amplify there. Um, we also developed a, a week-long summer camp out of that that industry was very happy to sponsor. We take some of those modules from that GM-sponsored program, package it with some other things, but again, a lot of graduate student involvement, great opportunity for them to teach. Um, now we're to the point we're getting two, three, 400 applications for camp and we're looking at ways to do that multiple weeks, but we've had no trouble with the industry um, when they see the number of students that are coming through and we make that completely free for them. Um, so, you know, you're still not touching all the students in Ohio, but to get them on campus working with students and they are coming from around the country now. Um, and then uh, ah, I'll, I'll save the third, uh, the third model for later, but basically at the state level, um, uh, well, the Ohio Energy Project, if anyone's familiar with that, um, we work with the uh, Sustainability Institute 
but they actually bring the teachers through and they do a summer long. I don't know exactly how it's sponsored, um, but they take high school teachers and get them out to places like Ohio State, like Mattel. Um, and we actually spend a full day with the high school science teachers showing them new things they haven't had exposure to. You know, I think about pointing them to things like the Canon, but we just give them a whole day of resources and say, these are things you can do in your classroom. Here's experiments, here's what's happening in the industry. Um, and in that program, we usually have about 50 teachers per summer, um, but they get a really intense program that helps to educate them and what's happening. That's energy focused, but could be easily, you know, redeployed in a model like that. So. I'm super glad to see everybody is really passionate about this topic. And I think it's a perfect thing for us to kind of revisit during lunch when we're having one on ones at our at our tables. But I want to make sure that we get enough time to talk about curricular programming before we actually do go to break. I know some people can't stay the after lunch chef sessions. So yeah, I'd like to <laughs> All right, thank you very much again. Uh, so it's great to see so many people so passionate about the curricular activities. So this is one of the few instances where people are actually looking forward to hearing about curricular stuff. So which is which is really unheard of <laughs> at OSU or elsewhere for that matter. <clears throat> uh, and it looks like I'm the only thing that stands between you and the lunch. So I'm going to be as quick as possible through all of this, but I would like to touch upon the most important issues that we have discussed and also just update you with what, uh, what we have been doing over the last year. Yeah, my name is Eila Mikiji and uh, yeah, Y and L needs to be swapped here, but never mind. Uh, uh, so um, we had this, uh, you know, task force, if you will, that we uh, went through uh, a number of uh, different things and we had uh, great discussions for almost 90 minutes. And um, I first started out by presenting uh, what, was, what was going on over the last year, what we have accomplished, what we we're planning to do. And then solicited some feedback about all of that. Uh, and we, in fact, collected a number of different suggestions that were great. Some of them apparently have also come up in other discussions, which is also very encouraging to hear coming from different perspectives, but they are all there. Uh, and some of the uh, conclusions that I will touch upon have emerged over and over again over the, uh, over the uh, course of uh, uh, this past hour and a half. Uh, and then um, we also looked at potential new programs and or track uh, uh, proposals. Just to give you guys an idea about where we stand in terms of the curricular programs, um, we went over a number of different criteria and wanted to see what would make sense as the first step to create new curricular programs and what our target audience should be. And we, after many, many discussions with uh, faculty at OSU, as well as our uh, industry partners, we started focusing on two main groups of students that may benefit from structured programs, curricular programs at OSU. One of them was the students with BS degrees, that are fresh out of their undergraduate programs that want to improve their standing in terms of cybersecurity, broaden their uh, knowledge base and everything else. And those that are currently in the workforce, that are currently working and would like to either, uh, uh, you know, cement their knowledge of cybersecurity or want to sort of progress in that direction. Um, so we immediately saw this disparity in terms of their background, potential backgrounds, their abilities and constraints. Uh, and we wanted to come up with a structure that would cater to the biggest common denominator as possible. Because you can imagine that someone who has, for example, uh, already, who, who some, uh, someone who's already a, um, a computer scientist, uh, 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 science degree, or someone who has been working in the industry for a while, but does not necessarily have gone through a, a structured uh, program before, they may all have a, a common interest in let's say different cybersecurity topics. So what we wanted to do was to create a, a, a flexible structure that would appeal to the most without sacrificing uh, what needs to be taught. So there, there, there are two things, right? So for that, we wanted to have what we call stackable uh, credentials that when put together would amount to a degree, but standalone, they would also serve a purpose, right? So for that purpose, we, we wanted to, um, again, create topical concentration areas 
We did not want to say just, which is a common thing for uh, professional master's uh, programs or uh, master's programs that is, here are the courses that you can select from. There are 1500 of them and then you get to choose six of them or something along those lines. So this is a very common practice. Or uh, just fill up all those courses. And by the way, uh, you have to uh, already uh, be uh, proficient in this and that and the other before you even take these courses. So we wanted to create topical concentration areas so that we can also create modular uh, programs that would be of interest both to industry as well as uh, uh, academic uh, uh, you know, stakeholders. We wanted to uh, make all these programs completely online so that we lift the uh, uh, geographic boundaries, make it flexible so that somebody in the workforce can take it at night. But if you have time uh, uh, some, uh, somewhere else during the week, you can do that as well. But also at the same time, you know, tackle issues such as labs, you know, how hands-on experience can, uh, can come into the picture, et cetera. So those would have been also a uh, 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 result. Um, and again, catering to uh, the widest uh, background audience as possible. With these certificates, you can pick your topics, combine them. If you combine two of them and add two more uh, courses to that, one project-based, the other one on ethics, you would be eligible to get a professional master's degree. So this was the starting out point. And then we started implementing it uh, in, uh, in reality. So we have come up with two uh, certificate programs which have been already designed uh, um, and approved through, uh, through the OSU's uh, um, you know, uh, approval process. One of them is often, uh, on offense and defense, and the other one is on design and implementation. So if you want to really, really, really take these and then put them into silos, one of them would be more along the lines of computer science oriented. The other one would be more uh, mostly electrical engineering oriented. But the focus is, again, on cybersecurity and what goes on. With it. So a uh, big shout out here to uh, uh, Jijang and also Aaron. Uh, those, uh, uh, those two gentlemen were my partners in crime right now. Uh, uh, they have contributed. And it wasn't a single effort. We have spent a lot of time discussing what the content should be. We are taking the perspective of both academia, I mean, which I am a part of, as well as the industry. So we asked the questions, tough questions, about what is relevant? What should we stick with? What should be the content that needs to be provided? And also looking back at the fundamentals. One thing that, I mean, there are very simple pitfalls that we, can, we could have fallen into. I'm hoping that we have avoided them. One of them was, to be a purist, saying that fundamentals uh, are what matters. We have to stick with fundamentals and what industry needs, they will figure it out later. Or we could have simply said, let's focus on what industry needs right now, right away, and never mind what the fundamentals are. We wanted to strike a good balance between the two because in the short term, one would be extremely beneficial, but then that information can simply fizzle away as the uh, uh, you know, uh, area evolves. In the other, uh, on the other hand, fundamentals are great to establish the, uh, uh, the basis of future knowledge, but it would uh, require a lot of ramp up time for people to be employed or you know, useful in the in industry. So we wanted to strike this balance so that the uh, students uh, who uh, complete either one of these certificates would be both well-versed in the fundamentals and all at the same time, ready uh, to be employed in the workforce pretty quickly. Okay. So we wanted to strike this balance. And um, based on that, we are currently also working on uh, uh, the approval of um, a professional master's program, which requires, again, the completion of two certificates, an ethics course, and a group project course. Right. So this is the basic uh, idea. Now, we have. Uh, uh, two other certificates in the works that are being designed. Uh, one of them is on cyber, analy uh, 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 cyber analytics. The other one is on management issues of cybersecurity, but we are definitely open to proposals and would like to discuss them more in detail um, and also encouraging people to actually work on those. And we are all uh, ready uh, with all our I would say limited, but still valuable experience in actually put uh, 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 passing these certificate programs through the 
approval process. Um, so those were discussed, obviously. Um, there were great suggestions about integrating the cybersecurity aspects in the uh, undergraduate uh, uh, programs and courses, that they shouldn't be an afterthought, that they should be integrated into the curriculum itself. It should not be an add-on, but it should be brought up over and over again, not as a senior course, but something that you have to start thinking about right off the bat. Right? So there are many uh, uh, great suggestions that have been uh, 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 put in the spotlight. Uh, we've discussed some of them and some of them have been already uh, brought up here also earlier today. Um, there were suggestions about how knowledge levels could be adjustable at least to the students at various levels of their education. You don't have to dump all the information ahead of time. You don't have to wait until the very end of their uh, 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 education ex experience to give the necessary information, but it could be telescopically included in the, uh, in the curriculum over, over time, which is really very important. Um, and we also discussed how the uh, um, Office of Distance Education could help with the development of these programs. They're already providing a lot of help and input, but what else they could do, how we could benefit in shaping these programs to be as effective as, they, as we would like. Um, so I guess this is a leftover from another presentation, another slide, but all right. So this is in a nutshell what we have discussed and where we stand. Um, two certificates already in the books. We're working on the establishment of at least two more. Uh, and um, there are definitely uh, issues that we have to work through. Uh, this Starting this fall, we are going to start these certificate programs. It will be an experience for all of us, who are, who, who's both, for, both for people who are actually teaching it as well as managing them. Uh, we, are, we will gain more information throughout this process and then improve upon that. So it's not a very rigid, stru rigid structure. And that's, that's the thing. We don't want it to be rigid. We want it to be pliable and also evolve naturally. And we are definitely looking forward to having input from uh, our industry partners. We would like to get more information from our academic partners and have suggestions you know, uh, uh, so that we can work uh, uh, together to come up with better programs and uh, better initiatives. So clearly, this is not the end game. We would definitely look, uh, would like to look further into the future and see what we can do in a systematic way in the undergraduate program. Most of our courses that appear right now in the books for these two certificates are open to our undergraduate students because they're at 5,000 level. Uh, so they straddle this, this gray area between undergrad, uh, senior undergraduates as well as master's program. So if somebody else were to come in and take these courses individually, they can too. So at least we have minded that. But these courses are probably in some uh, sense a little bit, uh, it might be a little bit too advanced for certain students who are coming in. So what can we do? How can we introduce them in this, in this direction, into this direction? That's a question that we have to work on. What can we do beyond at the graduate level? That's a good question as well. So we, have, we don't have necessarily uh, clear answers, but those are the directions that we'd like to keep in mind uh, going forward. Again, um, thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to at least uh, say, I don't know if that's a great question. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, there was one question regarding the process of engagement and how the external party professional can actually come in. One of the main issues that professionals have mm -hmm. with these type of programs is the ease of enrollment. And like if, if you look at our process of enrollment, mm -hmm. if you're a graduate student, it takes multi steps and certain rigidity mm -hmm. when it comes to that. Problem with professional is I know very successful chemical engineers mm -hmm. that became, you know, people involved in architecture in, in, in micro and computers. Mm -hmm. So there is no really a structure that you want to put in there that hinders these people. If I'm a chemical engineer, but I want to learn about that type of that program, it shouldn't be up to me as an educator to say, oh, you are a chemical engineer, you shouldn't really take that certificate because you're going to fail. Not that good, correct? So are we putting steps in place to make sure that all these hurdles 
And it's really up to the professional. Now, because you're saying they are a professional, which means right. they already have yes. accumulated Absolutely. knowledge base in there, that whatever their discipline is, they should be allowed if they want to take that. They time, are, of course. They are. Is, is, is that, is that, are these steps in place like here in registration? Absolutely. Level? Absolutely. So uh, we do not require a particular uh, uh, you know, domain as their BS degree, as a prerequisite. So they have to hold a BS yes. degree. Can the business, can be any? Yes, basically pretty much anything. And then what we intend to do is to look at their background at the admission process to see if they have the prerequisite knowledge, at least some basis for it, right? And then we try to, we will try to also understand if it is not clear to us whether or not they would be well-placed in the program to communicate with them to understand where they stand, right? As you said, some, a chemical engineer might be already very well versed in a lot of these topics. So basically tell them, sure, you know, these are the, and then we can point them to the right resources in case they feel uh, that they need a, a, a little more help in, in all of that, right? So this is, this is definitely already in the code itself. That is in the program, the program does not require, for example, a computer uh, engineering, computer science, or electrical engineering degree as a prerequisite. It is open to anyone with a BS degree. But of course, the admission criteria also requires us to also look at their record. But also, it, I mean, keep uh, keep the uh, we, we had to also keep the following in, uh, in mind. The individual certificates may have different requirements, and because they have different courses associated. With it. As an example, if you uh, uh, if the uh, uh, management in cybersecurity degree were to be implemented, the requirements there might be significantly different than, let's say, in, uh, uh, in, another, uh, in another area, right? So if you have to keep all the those in mind and then try and understand the applicants at an individual level, rather than simply putting them into an elimination box blindly and then see who comes out at the end. So this is, and we have to work with the students. And this is on us as educators to make sure that they succeed. We are not in the business of eliminating people. We are in the business of actually elevating people, right? So that's what we should do. If we, if we fail at that, that was the point of being here at us, right? That's the way I see it. Walid, uh, I think this group has also been informed by the sort of the best practices of building professional <laughs> master's programs. So if you look at TDAI's uh, master's program, there was a fair amount of market study of what type of people were coming in. And you knew some of the gaps they would have. So in order for them to learn, say, data analytics skills, if Python is a gap, then the initial portion of the course should expose them to those skills. So in fact, the courses have to be tweaked to take into account this broad audience. And in fact, you know, to your point, we should plan on this audience being very broad because the interests are coming from very broad uh, areas. People want to pick up these skills. So, so I think this will be a, a clear part of the design. So I'm glad you're bringing this point out. You know, um, I, I don't know if Julia or others have mentioned about the Trilogy Bootcamp. There is also a mechanism for, for you know, um, folks who have limited experience or just professional interest to take a boot camp that is offered by Ohio State, but taught by Trilogy. So that is, you know, uh, a cybersecurity uh, certification of some sort. It's really at a much lower level, uh, perhaps even below the undergrad education level we hope to get, but it's just one form of diversification in this training. And, you know, what we could do is to connect the dots, people doing that level of professional engagement to more at the bachelor's level, to more at the master's level. We can connect those dots here. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for bringing yeah. this up. I mean, in fact, in most of the courses that we have designed so far, that was the, I mean, so that's the message that we have given to everyone who was doing it. So assume that this is not going to be, uh, be uh, a graduate level course that you offer to PhD students. You have to accommodate people with diverse backgrounds. So introduction is an important. So just a follow-up question mm -hmm. to that, because of the BS requirement, mm -hmm. that includes a significant portion of anybody who has an associate degree, for instance. So somebody who took an associate degree, let's say Columbus Community College with a two-year, they mm -hmm. already have the, uh, you know, some background 
which can actually be quite applicable to what you know this is. And they're already in the workforce, meaning they've already started working in a company or government, but they don't have the, the BS degree. That's and as a result, they will be precluded from you know just taking part in this. So we thought about yeah, the dynamics I, you know, of just if, the pure, if, you know, just putting that BS requirement or leaving it and then having some a little bit of flexibility, like or other, and then other can be, you know, something that we quantify, like, you know, they come to us and they have an associate degree, we can look at it and say, oh, you know what, this person can actually fit. You know? I think it's a great idea. I yeah, think we should do So I, I would throw in some caution there. I think this is, you know, this is a, we're skinning a rather large uh, problem here. And there are very different ways of going about solving, uh, you know, uh, the need you are trying to meet. You know, uh, one of my CSE advisory folks has a, an entire training program in Silicon Valley for people who do not have a bachelor's program and gets them employment in a lot of companies, including, I would imagine, places like Cisco. Yes. So you do not need a bachelor's program to get employment in this area. But that doesn't mean that the kind of people we should focus on should have a bachelor's degree or not. I think we can take on a different uh, path and prepare students for you know, specialized skills, which are beyond you know, more or less um, operational security proficiency. So it's a very large market. We have to be strategic on what part of the market we address. So if we focus our education on people who have a bachelor's degree, I don't think we're making a mistake. We just need clarity on what type of student we are producing. And what in different products to be offered. Maybe mm -hmm. this one is for the bachelors and we work with Columbus State on a two plus two for other options. Exactly. Yeah. That might be Columbus State's cake. Yes. Uh, Bob? Yeah. Are we are we looking at delivery, um, whether it's online or off hours or those kinds of things? Because when you work with employed adult learners, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're going to be competing with other entities, whether that's the community colleges or professional you know, development organizations that are keenly so, aware of how to work with those types of students. So this is going to be, uh, this, 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 both certificates have been designed to be fully online. Uh, but since they are also in the books for Ohio State uh, uh, curricula, uh, they will be also held in person in most cases. So there will be set hours where you can either join in in person or uh, remotely, uh, like in real time, or uh, those courses would be available to you offline as well to be uh, viewed at, 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 at your own pace. Yeah. The hybrid model. I yeah, it, it has to be because otherwise, then it, it, there is no point. In it. Exactly. I, will, I would encourage you to sit at his table for lunch. <laughs> so I don't want to fuck right. up everybody. Thank else. you very much. Thanks for it. Elon, thank you so much. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. Um, people online, come back in 30 minutes, 25 minutes, and everybody else in here, come back here. Also, if you are not like me and you throw food in your face, you're welcome to bring plates and food back into the room and, and eat for our afternoon session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, good afternoon. We are going to look into our research areas this afternoon. Again, these were sessions from last week. So our, um, our session leaders and, and faculty champions for these areas are going to give um, a report out of everything that was discussed. I have a 10 Bob first. Everybody's all like, you know, fat and happy now, so it should be good. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we have very limited amount of time for Q&A. I know there's a lot of people running, um, trying to join the OC3 meeting this afternoon, so we might keep things a little bit short. Keep them moving. If I jump up here, you know your time's over. Thank you. Are the slides going to? Yeah, you want the uh, bigger or you can stay smaller? Oh, uh, okay. Any, anything. Any questions? Right, so I'm 
uh, Dr. Ted Allen. This is Mr. Bob Pardee. Uh, we're here representing um, the cyber range. And the, unfortunately, by uh, bad coincidence, um, uh, Dr. Becca Michaels, who is the executive director of the cyber range, didn't get to talk this morning. So we're going to try and do a little bit of introduction in case everybody knows, doesn't know what it is. Uh, um, there, there's, uh, we're not going to talk about that certificate. That's not our thing. Um, so this Ohio Cyber Range is, um, is a shared environment for supporting cybersecurity training and credential building. And Becca Michaels is the executive staff director for the Ohio Cyber Range Institute, which is, encompasses the cyber range. They're, they're adamant that it's not just the educational environment. So what that, and I, we, we, um, it's not just that, it, it's a broader concept and it does reach through K through 12 and cyber clubs. And what, what, it, what, it, um, what it, it, it means to us as faculty, because I'm a faculty person, is that uh, if I come up with some new educational thing, it's a way for me to reach K through 12 and I can brag on my NSF proposal and my, that I have done that and I have all these K through 12 people using it. And, and so, and hopefully they really do use it and it really does work. And, but, but basically that's uh, one part of it too. And then it's part of uh, General Bartman was when he was the adjutant general started this Ohio Cyber Council. And then underneath that, that one of the things besides the reserve that Bob is key to is this uh, Ohio Cyber Range. And that's where we do, we share our teaching practices. So the idea, I think, uh, I don't know if Becca was here as she was saying this, let's say that Waleed developed some great thing about a module for his course that he's doing. He could then use the virtual uh, environments on the, on the range and, and put his, some of his materials on the range and then and teach part of his class through the range and then uh, it would not just be at Ohio State. It would, it would help and nourish all corners of Ohio. That, that, I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, Bob? Yeah, sure. So the Cyber Range Institute um, kind of tries to help collabor or collaboratively develop um, uh, laboratory uh, experience for, for students. Um, and you can, when as you put things on the on the range, you can also contribute things to the statewide effort to say, uh, you know, this is a really useful exercise. Other institutions teaching the same thing might actually find this uh, the same exercise to be useful in their scenario, and they can bring it in. Um, that doesn't mean that everything that you put is automatically co-opted by the range, and you you know you you lose any ownership of it. But you can certainly um, collaborate uh, with other institutions statewide um, in providing better training opportunities for your students. Um, the other thing, so the uh, technically, right, it is, uh, this is a virtual environment housed at um, uh, the University of Cincinnati and the University of Akron um, with connections out to educational institutions around the state. Um, and to National Guard armories around the state, um, and we uh, we can we have the ability, and we're we're working on the technology how we're going to do that to uh, to connect in physical environments from other institutions. Um, but but in addition to just having your sort of basic uh, um, uh, virtual environment, right? They, they have some specialized technologies for doing things like simulating network traffic. And this is really important because if you're designing a cybersecurity exercise where somebody is supposed to find the attack in a bunch of normal network traffic, you have to have a bunch of normal network traffic for them to find the attack in. Uh, otherwise, you have to have uh, generated all that, net that network traffic. Well, they have uh, specialized equipment for doing that that is integrated into the range and that you can integrate into whatever environments uh, you want to deploy on the range. Um, that, that, uh, that equipment is also capable of injecting traffic that you want to be part of the exercise that you're, you're doing. Um, so we'll be, uh, we'll be looking 
tomorrow. So tomorrow, okay. The, the, as far as the uh, Range Institute is, is concerned, there's the executive staff, there's the executive committee, uh, which kind of oversees what happens to the, the, uh, the range. Um, and then there's the, uh, the advisory committee. And the advisory committee is made up of individuals from different institutions that participate with the range. And I'm, I've been uh, working with the advisory committee. They're meeting tomorrow. If there are things that you want brought up to the range um, as, hey, we really should uh, be thinking about how we're gonna do this, please see me today and, and I'll make sure that those issues get raised. Um, and if there are folks that wanna participate on the advisory committee, let me know. And I, I don't know how exactly they're uh, determining you know, who is on there. I think uh, institutions can have more than one person or whatever. And if it's more appropriate that somebody else from Ohio State start being the person that participates there, uh, great. I just wanna make sure that we were represented. So. Uh, again, see me uh, if you've got questions about that. Go ahead, so yeah, so I'm now just going to go through the regular part of what we plan. Yep. Um, so our session goal was to try to get everyone, including the people who are online, <laughs> to think I can contribute to the range and benefit from the range. Uh, and and that uh, and and that was and then also I myself am willing to participate in or lead some proposals. Uh, and one of the great nuts that that Dr. Michael Michaels and and uh, Richard uh, uh, down at, at Cincinnati have cracked is this Department of Labor money. So so um, so like we talked about that boot camp today, that was a Department of Labor grant that that uh, that Cincinnati got, and I'm interested in trying to work maybe with them and get more of that. Um, and so we can talk about that. So what we did in the meeting was we went around and everybody who was there said something. I started. And um, so uh, I, my little research group, we're developing with, with uh, partners. I'll talk about the partners. Three modules for the range, or for, they're called laboratories. Zero to hero, that is supposed to take people like me who didn't really know that much cybersecurity and get us a week and do a script or two and make bust a move. And you get Kali Linux, so uh, so so you get a, the the range already has uh, some nice environments you can build up. So you don't always have to make your own new virtualized environment. You can bounce off one they already have, and they already have an attack machine with Kali Linux and a bunch of dumb uh, you know uh, attacking machines that you can mess with. And so our lab, where we try to position zero to hero, is on the low end in the sense that going from like, you don't know anything to some level of ethical hacking. Then the next lab, um, there's a commercial game called Threat Gen that I think is a great thing. I recommend that to everybody as a as pay $15 and play. But we are just gonna, we haven't done it yet, but we're gonna bundle some activities around that and, and just put those on, on the range. Then the last one, that's the big one where we need Bob's group to help us with um, we're developing a virtualized version that's sort of similar to the CDME Ames lab, and um, or we're trying to make it as similar as we can, and then you can attack it, and uh, and uh, and so that will be a full what the range is all about. You you make a virtual environment that you literally put on there, and then they can clone it and make lots of copies, and then you uh, then you you uh, attack it, and 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 we, it's a game, uh, so. So the attackers have multiple things and, and the defenders have five actions we already have in Defender. And first thing we're doing is just everybody go through, follow us, here's five steps to compromise the thing. And then here's five defending actions. And then we open it up to a red versus blue. And, and uh, so that's those are the three laboratories that I, I'm optimistic we'll have all three on the range by the end of summer. So you could potentially put them in your classes. We're a regional programming center. Um, in their wisdom, I thought I really mean this. In the wisdom of Helen and and Hesham, they uh, they decided that the way that we're going to contribute in Ohio is as as leaders of manufacturing and mobility related to cybersecurity, and um, and I think that's a, a cool a cool emphasis because it put us in touch with CDME and CAR, and um, they're very successful enterprises. So that was what I talked about myself, uh, Mark. 
described his role where he literally was in charge of this whole mess of things. It's all his fault. Yep. <laughs> and then, so then Bob here, he, he talked about um, the, how they're contributing to ISI cyber and, and that we're going to expand it to, to span more uh, elements of MITRE attack, which is basically a framework for a whole bunch of different ways to attack. Um, then uh, Julie uh, talked about OHIO and the importance of, of what we're doing and how, how it relates to her vision for, for ICDT. And then Anish uh, described his role as, chief, as a chair and his powwow project really interacts, I think, very nicely with what we're trying to do with manufacturing. And uh, he talked about um, uh, some 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 interactions with Aruba company, and then Hashem described his role as the you know the founder of this institute, our co-founder, and then David Sweezy des described uh, interest at the College of Arts and Sciences. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so some other folks. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let me see. Atal and Matt uh, were uh, were talking about. Uh, Testing with uh, with ISI Cyber and ThreatGen. Um, Kathy Chia uh, described her past research uh, and and interest in doing more of that kind of thing with uh, with the uh, the range. Uh, Deb Boyd and John Whitcomb uh, talked about OTEC and uh, the fact that you know they they have a couple of needs uh, to to work in the the range. They're also through um, ORNET, the provider of connectivity to the range, and uh, because more people are starting to look at gamification of security um, and uh, ways to, to research security um, as a red versus blue uh, oppositional kind of uh, activity, um, they talked about the use of, of the uh, Ohio Supercomputing Center for uh, analysis of the kinds of uh, data you're collecting there. Um, let me see, John Ho. Uh, actually spoke, talked about uh, Ohio, uh, I'm sorry, no, uh, through the stuff that we can be doing with um, uh, State of Virginia, who is, has a similar kind of uh, effort along the, the lines of cyber range stuff. Um, John Weisman uh, was talking about uh, ODE and, and bringing more of this kind of stuff to uh, K through 12. And uh, actually be adding to fund because a lot of the the uh, the range funding today is ODHE um, you know higher ed and uh, the uh, the adjutant general's part department um, and so uh, they're talking about uh, ODE beginning to uh, uh, send some funds into this uh, as well um, to uh, to get more k-12 uh, activity uh, there um, let me see, uh, we talked about uh, work on smart mobility um, and uh, the work with ThingWorks. And one of the things with ThingWorks is uh, this is this will allow us to send a lot of uh, device telemetry and, and those kinds of things uh, into a range environment so that people who don't have access to all of the kinds of physical hardware that we have access to can actually see and interact with, uh, with some of that. So uh, one of the things I'm going to be talking to the uh, the um, advisory committee about is uh, how do we get that that stuff funneled into the range in the most meaningful way. Um, and then ZQ talked about uh, he's worked on virus uh, vulnerabilities in the cybersecurity club uh, and the uh, the really excellent lecture series. So uh, we're going to continue. We're going to be actually uh, for future work leading some workshops on the cyber uh, range and, and how you can use it in your research and education. Um, we're gonna test three labs, the Zero to Hero, uh, Threat Gen, and the ISI Cyber. Um, gonna work on uh, getting four courses regularly teaching uh, using some of that uh, uh, range material in the training and uh, have two uh, NSF, uh, Trustworthy Cyberspace proposal. And then um, uh, I'm going to be working on that uh, advisory meeting. So again, my email is up here. If you have questions or suggestions for the advisory group uh, and for the range committee, please let me know, and I'm I'm happy to uh, raise those. Thanks.
we don't have time for questions right now, but what we are, what I'm proposing we do is that at 1.30 when we wrap up, anyone who would like to stick around, we'll go ahead and open up anybody online to join the discussion and anyone, uh, our, our faculty who are willing to stick around and, and engage in that discussion will do so at 1.30. Thanks. Uh, mobility and manufacturing, which we have lumped together today. How much time we have? Eight <laughs> minutes. Eight minutes. <laughs> you can do okay, it. So we'll we'll try. Try. <laughs> <laughs> you want to start? Okay. So, uh, so mobility and manufacturing. This is, I think, the cyber range uh, extension to the application. Uh, of mobility and manufacturing. We talked about that part in our discussion. Vimal is taking care of the manufacturing part and I'm taking care of the mobility part. So our session goals for this was basically offer an overview of progress that we've made so far with the OSIM initiative and then sort of get input from faculty that weren't present or weren't part of the OSIM initiative just to kind of introduce them and their viewpoints and then also get some industry perspective. Yeah, so from the industry side, we have, uh, we had Aptiv, Christy from Aptiv, uh, we had uh, Brian Brian from Rockwell, and then we, we were seeing non OSIM faculty, Professor Musa, uh, Topic Musa was there. We wanted some additional perspective of what we were doing. Does that match with the industry folks or other faculty members looking at the same problem? So yeah, so we, Aptiv, Participate. Uh, they presented like for 10 to 15 minutes. So it was a good discussion from their side also. So moving on to the next slide. Yep. So <clears throat> again, um, Skadir and I kind of gave an overview on the OSM project and the current state of it. So we procured funding last year under the Rapids State of Ohio grant from ODHE to essentially build out a SCADA system at, at CDME, where we were going to try to take a lot of the $12 million plus in equipment that we have and sort of put it on um, online, essentially, so in the digital manufacturing industry 4.0. And the goal was to eventually create a campus-wide cybersecurity test bed under OSIM, which would link up TDAI, CAR, and CDME, and have a, a common portal to it, and then eventually create training modules along with TED and others, and then hook them up to the Ohio Cyber Rage Institute. <laughs> So we kind of gave progress to date. Uh, obviously, COVID sort of happened, uh, which sort of slowed down some of our things. But we did manage to train a handful of students in getting introduced to PTC ThingWorks, which is a cloud platform that we're using. Uh, you can kind of see here we bought some. Uh, we bought both the, the vehicle, and we also were able to buy uh, uh, PLCs and equipment. And uh, some of TED students were able to also build an injection molding. So this is a piece of equipment at ISC. And we've kind of got a dashboard and thing works kind of set up for that. Uh, another thing that we then did was kind of talk through broad areas of research areas and manufacturing that other faculty and others could kind of collaborate with us on. So the three main areas sort of, you know, potential for theft or access to technical information, um, whether that's computer chips that get compromised or IP that gets stolen, uh, potential for alteration of technical data and processes. So just in time manufacturing sort of becoming a big thing where people might be doing uh, uh, additive manufacturing, 3D printing on Navy vessels and other stuff. And design flaws can then be introduced into these things. So a part fails after 5,000 hours rather than 10,000 hours. Those type of things, changing the process can be kind of catastrophic. And then the potential for supply chain disruptions or, or denial of process control. So I think we all woke up this morning to kind of hear about the fact that I think uh, the meat packing plants were, were hit pretty hard last night. And then also, the New York Metropolitan Transit Authority said they were hacked in April. So uh, those are kind of the completely stop the supply chain rather than just sort of introduce a, a process variation or steal some IP. Um, yeah, so besides the mobi uh, manufacturing part on the mobility side, um, this uh, OSIM project is, yes, we are working on the project itself, but it is helping us to interact with other faculty members like ZQ, his student is joining this activity, Professor Musa Taufik, his students are joining. Then we have an altogether a different project going on with Department of Transportation uh, for the PNT, Position Navigation and Timing Security in Automated Vehicles, where DOT is working on several mobility cyber ranges. 
and they were happy to listen that we are working on OSU's or Ohio's version of that. So we'll be learning about their uh, mobility cyber range and see what topics uh, are overlapping or what topics we can ex uh, extend to. With the current facility that we have, you can see the vehicle. Um, we we were able to procure it. We were make, able to make it auto. Um, we were able to automate it. We are waiting for the sensors to make it autonomous and make it and hook it up to the cloud. So the cloud part, uh, the cloud connectivity part is going on these days. Sensors part is held back because the sensor package that we aimed uh, is not available to buy until next year. So we'll get there. But students working on this uh, mobility cyber range, they are looking at the perception attacks right now. How perception, uh, let's say stop sign covered in a shadow or in a snow can deceive the vehicles and its decision. And we are also looking at if we have some remote navigation capabilities and what challenges it will bring in uh, the mobility sample range. Christy from Active presented her perspective of uh, cybersecurity challenges. And we learned that a lot of stuff that we are doing aligns with what they are aiming for, which was good for us. Uh, yes, they have more resources. We are starting in that area, but definitely she was very open to collaborate, uh, let our students visit their lab and learn the tools from there. So it was a pretty good uh, participation from her side. Professor Musa, he is more of a physical uh, layer security person. So he is, he talked from his perspective, what challenges uh, when it comes to the uh, chip uh, security can uh, cause problems in automotive systems. You jumped to the last one. So how much? Yeah. Yeah, this is the last one, yeah. So basically we had an open discussion that kind of ensued then with, um, with us that we kind of facilitated with some seating questions. And what we kind of discovered was, as, as uh, Kadir just mentioned, that industry is working on similar problems. Um, and I think the common theme that was sort of expressed by Don and others is that there's a strong need to have skilled practitioners. And what we also kind of found was that industries tackling this, at least Active said, you know, at all stages, you know, so when they get it from the supplier, they test it. When they put it in the vehicle, it gets tested. So that was kind of interesting to see that it is, cybersecurity is now sorting, sort of permeating all aspects of it. It's not like just the endpoint things. So they have to kind of worry about a lot of things. Um, and so there's lots of supply chain issues. They do try to keep some of the protocols and communication secret. And I think we talked about that, whether we could potentially as a university gain access to some of those tools. Um, that they use to sort of debug and test those things. Um, the other thing was just that introduce cybersecurity at early stages and in all stages of development, I think is a common theme. Yep. So based on this, we will continue, what are, what are our next steps? We'll continue working on the test bed. Uh, it is far from completion. Whenever I say we are working on the mobility cyber range, the next question is, okay, can we have access to it? I said, no, we are not there yet. So uh, that's, a, that's the question that we are chasing these days now. Collaborating with other faculty members, we are open to what extent they can, uh, let's say, uh, offer their services or offer their research practices for the mobility and manufacturing side. Human interaction is, is a big topic because hacker is a human and human dynamics are important <laughs> for us. So uh, that's an area that we'll be stretching out and aligning our efforts with the curriculum development that can help students to gain hands-on experience on these uh, test specs. So with this, I think we're done. Yeah, are you able to stick around a few minutes after? Yes. All right, there you go. Okay. Wonderful, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We have uh, VQ. <laughs> Dr. Lin and Waleed uh, talking about full stack, digging into um, you know everything from your your low level and your hardware into low level of the higher um, human interactions, AI. I mean, really, you have the whole tech scan. Right. All right. Uh, good you. afternoon. Um, today, um, I, I'm ZQ. Uh, I'm a faculty from uh, CSC department. Uh, I do research on software security. Uh, with me today is uh, Professor Waleed Kalio. Uh, he's a faculty from ECE and expert on hardware security. Um, last Friday, we had an all-hands session uh, to uh, discuss um, the needs uh, of the faculty members uh, in order for them to succeed with ICTT. 
and also define the metrics on what do we mean we meet a success uh, with ICTT, and finally the strategic areas of focus. And uh, today I'm going to give a briefing on what we discussed and what it will give a summary on our action plan. Um, okay, so um, we know faculty are all CEOs and they manage their time and their agenda. So how to motivate faculty to work together, that's a huge challenge. Um, so we have to ask this question, ask this question for myself. Why as a faculty member would like to be affiliated with, with ICTT? Uh, I believe there are two reasons. Uh, one is uh, cybersecurity is so interdisciplinary and so cross-cutting, right? If you want to build a defense, you have to know a full, a full stack of knowledge, okay? Um, so ICDT uh, give us this, give us a platform and bring together on various expertise and then, uh, uh, and then we can uh, perform this convergent research. The second reason is um, I know faculty are tirelessly writing proposals. And if you say, hey, write a big grants, and then you may need to write proposals for the next couple of years. So ICTT have, you know, give this opportunity as well. And there are many, many, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, federal investments on cybersecurity. And, uh, you know, there's a great opportunity for faculty to, you know, write large proposals. Um, and then, hey, how to really motivate faculties, right? Those are the visions, maybe some many of not by him. So we really have to make it concrete. And then many ideas have been brought up. Uh, for instance, um, we can buy out uh, the teaching time of faculty if you say you need a proposal, right? Um, this has been mentioned by Hesham. And also, how about where, where ICTT provides seed funds? Uh, is it possible? And uh, then can we know your the indirect cost rate? Uh, for, for the industry group. And um, maybe we can also have cluster hiring, hire multiple faculties, right, work, work together for something. And then you can also negotiate with OAA for some, for, for some kind of benefits, right? And even you can hire professional grant writers to help you write successful proposals. Uh, so those are great ideas. I think we will work on how to <laughs> concretize this. Um, and then we spend a lot of time discuss this, hey, what do we succeed? What are the metrics? Uh, certainly uh, jobs or how, like, uh, like what kind of um, uh, graduates we have trained uh, from ICTT. So um, jobs or how is the number one since we discussed and also we discussed about return investment, what kind of uh, investment the university is willing to provide and then what the return we can gain, so on and so forth. So um, uh, we still haven't finalized this yet. I think this is still under the discussion and we have to also talk to the leadership and finalize those items. I think these are the uh, action items uh, um, what you will talk about. And then um, we have to build a brand of our ICTT, right? We, so, so if people think about OSU has ICTT, what they do? And then we know we have to build on top of our existing strengths. Um, in fact, OSU has, has many institutes and centers. Uh, for instance, uh, while it has uh, needing two centers on supply chain security, uh, here's like multi million dollars of, of grants from like AFIL. Uh, 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 and, um, and also CSC, uh, I think in the past uh, year, we, we wrote two AI Institute proposals. There are millions, I mean, tens of millions of dollars uh, of grants. Um, and uh, CSC is actually quite well known in the community on this on, on HPC and uh, uh, networking security. Uh, even I do some Bluetooth research and some faculty doing Wi-Fi um, and um, software security. That is my expertise. And uh, like we have car centers doing mobility. We have cyber car um, and, uh, and we have CD, CDME, those centers and also like uh, um, uh, Anish is leading uh, the, the POVO lab, uh, IoT lab. So these are the, our existing strengths. We should continue uh, building success uh, in these directions. And uh, of course, we have to invest in future directions. Uh, for instance, um, um, uh, quantum computing, right? this is a super hard right now. And uh, OSU has a medical school uh, where we should also look into the uh, problems uh, with medical security. And, um, and uh, there are other new opportunities such as with DODs or like full stack uh, bug bounty programs. Next, um, I'm going to let uh, you talk about our main objectives uh, for next year. So we, we basically had a very good participation when we had the, the ROM session to kind of collect the thoughts of um, the participants in there. And this is kind of the list of main objectives that we came for the 22 fiscal year. First of all, 
the, one of the main thing that came is that there is really lack of participation among faculty in there. So we wanna use the ICTT as an opportunity to enrich that and possibly just have a seed that we can collaborate. I could collaborate with ZQ, I can collaborate with DIT or people can just cross with each other. The second thing is <clears throat> there is a lot of money outside and there will be a lot of money outside. I have a lot of sources for work in this space. There will be a lot of money allocated from many sources within industry and government in this space. So we need to just kind of see how can we work together to build on some of the successes that we have and the engagement to tap into that uh, sources of money. And then the last point is very important because the only way we're going to get uh, engagement at the upper layer of OSU is basically work together, uh, have the PI community come together with the leadership and put together some plan for long and short-term goals that we would like to deliver and collectively go after these plans in there. And that is going to be coupled with incentives and important is success metrics because you know somebody is going to give you something at the end of the day, you're going to be liable and questionable to show exactly what did you do with it. So in terms of action plan, we're going to put together some working groups that tackles a lot of these issues in there. What are the thrust that we wanna focus in? Uh, what are <clears throat> uh, the steps that we need to do for planning for our proposals? Uh, what are going to be our metrics? How do we get measured in there? And what are the investment and incentive strategies that we have to achieve or put together that we ask our leadership to deliver to? <clears throat> we're going to introduce us and use a lot of the community here through some regular workshops. You know, the people actually can hear what re great research DQ is doing, for instance, even though uh, <clears throat> you're just kind of next door to him, but you've never actually seen him before. <laughs> Knowing the strength of each other, if I want to tap into Ted's work, I need to know what he does. So how can I do that? Well, he needs to kind of give me or give us as a community a, a preview of what he does. And <clears throat> another thing is we're going to have some formal invitation, people that we know that are our contacts, bring them over, introduce them to the community. So they're not just tied to myself or ZQ or somebody else. And finally, is looking into <clears throat> planning for NSF IUCRC like centers where we can involve the industry with our community here and you know put together a, a strategy for an IUCRC. So these are kind of the concrete steps that we took or the action plan that we took uh, out of our meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Dr. Dwayne Wagner from the Department of Psychology mm -hmm. on a topic that keeps keeps coming up today. It keeps coming <laughs> up. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, so. Um, as Julia said, my name is Dwayne Wegener. I'm in the Department of Psychology. Um, and I wanted to start just by thanking the people that were involved in the uh, all hands session uh, last week. Um, and I want to reiterate my invitation that if you are a person that is passionate about the, the role of the, the human components of, of cybersecurity, um, and even if you're not passionate about that, if you're interested in that and would like to be a part of the building out process, which I think we are really at the beginning stages still rebooting uh, after a year of, uh, of isolation, but, um, but please do reach out to me. I didn't put it on here, but I'm, I'm Wegener.1, every other letter is an E, W-E-G-E-N-E-R.1. Um, that's how long my affiliation has been with, with Ohio State. I was a dot one. Um, and so um, in terms of the goals that we had, consistent with really being at the beginning and rebooting this process, we were really looking to identify, first of all, the common interests um, that people have across the different levels of analysis that are relevant to human dynamics. Um, and look at, at the connections with uh, anything from the development of cybersecurity and, te and technology tools to their uses and the, and the impact that those human dynamics have in that system. Uh, we also wanted to uh, assess the potential participation by current institute affiliates. And so that it was great. There were lots of people involved in that session that I hadn't directly interacted with previously. And so it was great to get a read on the, the wide variety of people with those interests. 
Um, but we also wanted to identify the, the gaps that we have in the expertise uh, in terms of the people that are already connected, because we have a lot of wide ranging expertise within the university uh, to which we can connect and, and that we would like to involve. Um, I think throughout that discussion, one of the very clear themes is that from the top to bottom at all different levels of analysis, there's a lot of interest in the notion of what makes quote unquote trustworthy information that starts anywhere from the very low levels of how algorithms are built uh, that are used say in AI or, or machine learning kinds of contexts um, where those tools were often built initially with goals like efficiency or maximizing attention. Um, if you think about you know, social media and some of the mo business models uh, for those kind of enterprises, the goal is to get eyes on content, um, but that ignores what the content is. And that has created all kinds of issues um, from top to bottom. We also talked about how in other domains like information theory, the notion of information was defined in a way that was context free, um, just as simply bits of, of information. And for both of those kind of very low level kinds of um, mechanisms, it ignores the quality of the information that we're dealing with. And so as we're seeing these tools be put into place, we're seeing the vulnerabilities that come from that. Um, and it calls for us to think carefully about how at those levels do we build in something about the quality and the context of the information that is a part of those, um, of, of those technologies, software, even, even uh, in some hardware related kinds of, of ways. Um, and so um, we then also talked about some interesting ongoing kinds of uh, efforts that people are putting into things like indicators of whether information is trustworthy using, for example, natural language indicators in, say, text streams and, and when people are on social media or other contexts being able to um, automate ways to try to discover and identify whether information has a factual basis, for example. Um, and also at the more social behavioral kind of level, we didn't talk about this quite as much. Some of this is my own work and I, we didn't spend a lot of time in that meeting talking about it, but looking at how people use the sources of information as an indicator for them of whether they can trust and use that information or not. And using people's own existing beliefs as a way to screen whether it's information that's trustworthy to them or not. Um, is a huge issue here. It's a part of that important context, right? That it was not there from the beginning of something like information theory in terms of if it fits with my beliefs, then I'm going to think it's true, right? And so there are those kinds of levels. And so there are lots of different social behavioral kinds of factors that were identified in our discussions using some different kinds of terms. Uh, in some cases, they might talk about it as social engineering. In others, maybe as human factors. But there, for different disciplines, uh, the language is somewhat different. And one of the themes that kind of went throughout all of that is in fact, even the meaning of the term trust seems to differ across some of those different applications and use of, of that uh, notion. And so um, this was a big theme of what we talked about, trustworthiness of information. It's certainly not the only way uh, in which human dynamics are relevant. Uh, and so there are a number of, of other things we also discussed. One piece of that is that we still have a very strong need to reach out um, I, as examples. And, and these are, are certainly salient to me because I'm a part of arts and sciences. Um, but there are many different levels within uh, ANS that we do not have directly connected yet. And that can go anywhere from mathematics uh, related to some of the algorithms and, and such that are used um, to linguistics, cognitive psychology, communications, political science. There are all kinds of levels of analysis um, that are a part of ASC that we absolutely um, should connect here in various ways. And the assembled group that we had had a number of uh, missing types of expertise that are at the university, but that we don't have uh, linked into this effort presently. 
Um, we talked to some about the education uh, and curricular kinds of roles that there might be for human dynamics that's come up in a number uh, of the discussions. Um, it's a crucially important, I think, to address that and find ways so that people who are being trained in cybersecurity are also being alerted to the human components of all phases of cybersecurity. Um, and I do think that that both on the education side and on the research side, that greater integration of the human components can in fact differentiate um, the efforts within this institute from the efforts that are going on uh, at other universities. But there are absolutely constraints. And from an ASC kind of perspective, those constraints include things like over the last number of years, to the extent that our core programs have really been squeezed, it, that makes it harder to then engage people and convince them, as we've heard from some others, to come and be involved uh, across disciplines. Uh, and so th these are things that we do have to um, address if we're going to be successful in this effort. I also wanna mention, and, and because I do think of this more broadly, even though I personally do conduct research dealing with misinformation spread and those kinds of things, but the human dynamics in cybersecurity are a lot broader than just dealing with misinformation or untrustworthy uh, information. There are lots of human components of engaging uh, with training, for example, with maintenance of cybersecurity over time, with engaging with cybersecurity outside of things like mandatory training and how even the notion of mandatory training tells people this is not my job or this is all I need to know because otherwise they would make it mandatory. Um, and so there are all kinds of different components um, that lead into the human dynamics that either engage people or disengage people uh, from their role in cybersecurity. And those connections, I think, give us lots of opportunities uh, to, to leverage for, for funding of research, for funding uh, of the educational side, uh, et cetera. Um, and so in terms of uh, just to reiterate some of our primary themes, I think we identified very strong interest and synergy surrounding the notion of trustworthiness of information. Um, and th that's great because it's also a, it's in the name of the Institute. And so um, we certainly want to have that as a major theme of our work. Um, we did identify some expertise that was missing from the current group and we need to address that. Um, and also identified some potential funding programs um, that we could pursue as a group. In terms of objectives, this is not coming directly out of the discussions from last Friday, but I think it leads to some, uh, some very reasonable next steps. Um, I think that, um, uh, that we can uh, identify and communicate directly with researchers that are relating, uh, that are, are doing work that relates directly to issues related to trust uh, and to trust of information. Um, I, I hope that there are partners that I have out there in that effort to help me make those connections, to identify those, those folks and to uh, broaden our group. Um, I really think that we have uh, a, a core uh, group of people that can be assembled into working groups that surround uh, issues related to trustworthiness uh, of information. And I think it would be great to have kind of a top to bottom kind of workshop within the university to, to introduce people to existing work and people that are experts at the different levels of analysis that relate uh, to those issues. Um, and then I think we, we also, uh, it's quite feasible for us to form groups, uh, subgroups of that larger group to, poten to potentially um, pursue funding opportunities that can integrate the technological and human facets. And if we could, over this coming year, establish two or three groups that are funded to do that kind of integration, that would really help us to establish that aspect of the Institute. Thank you. So I will, I'm just going to give a couple of remarks. Thank you, Dwayne. And thank you, everybody. We had that just sort of shotgun approach. So um, if you would like to stay, we're going to open up the, we still have a few people, 17 or so online. So I'd like to give them a chance to speak. If you have conversations you want to hold, I just ask you to leave the room and use the lobby to do that. Um, before we do, I want to, since Hesham had to step out, I want to read emphasize his vision of community. And what we saw here today was people coming from different colleges, different departments, different corporations to represent that community. And 
to see that how we have different strengths that we bring as we are we take different roles on teams when we work together, different perspectives, different ways we think, um, but also obviously different subject matter expertise and, and trying to find holes and plug gaps and form these multidisciplinary teams across campus, whether they were research faculty, clinical faculty, teaching faculty, staff with different hats or industry partners as um, customers or as collaborators. Um, so I, I wanna reiterate what ZQ said about how do we motivate and support our faculty as an institute um, in the communication? How do we support them in time, resources, opportunities? And as Steve Bivick says, the institute's role is to make it easier. Now, you can go do your thing independently, but the institute should make it easier. So, um, and as well, you've pointed out, what are the success metrics? I think that's great. I don't know that those are stated, so that's something we should discuss. How can we measure our meaningful growth? So those are my parting thoughts. Um, thank you all today. And I hope you can stick around for a few minutes, but if not, I appreciate all the time you spent today. Yes, yeah. just good. Is it possible for us to get this deck? Yes, we can make this deck available and the recording as well. Okay. And um, Hal and I will work on splicing it up so that you can jump to certain portions for the okay. day. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Great meeting, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, Rick.